All right, lads, welcome to my fourth installation of my tank tech tree guides. After covering the Yanks, Vatniks, and the Germans, it's time for me to review the tanks of my birth nation. So you can trust that I'm going to give you a completely unbiased view, packed full of tips and recommendations. Granted, mainly recommendations to skip, but it is what it is. Britain and its empire, ironically, has never been a land power. Fighting large wars on open soil, that's just not for us. That's the sort of things the uncivilised Germans do. Instead, given the state of British food and women, we decided that exploring the open oceans and stealing foreigners' national treasure was a far better use of our time. Because of this, we relied heavily on our navy for protection, as well as power projection. Why field a large and expensive army that's prone to mutinying, when you can just sail a few battleships into someone else's port and add a few thousand square miles to your empire? This is just a long introduction to basically explain why the British tech tree is, well, a bit shit. We never really had a land-based military industrial complex, we just had burly northern men who could make ships or trains. So when it came to making tanks, we had some really shit ideas. Not as bad as the decision to scrap HMS Warspite, but still pretty terrible. Anyway, I've had to experience hours of playing all seven ranks of the British tech tree for this video, which has caused me so much emotional damage I could have made it into a chapter of Blood Meridian. Moving on though, the British Tech Tree is one of the original five nations in War Thunder, but its tank lineup came much, much later, after the Russian, German, and American Tech Trees had been added. And to be honest, it hasn't received anywhere near as much love from Gaijin or the community compared to the three other big nations. This results in the British Tech Tree being pretty bare bones in terms of the amount of tanks available, especially at top tier. But this is also due to Britain decimating its own arms industry in the 1980s. The lack of quantity of tanks is also made worse by the quality of the tanks that we do have. They are generally very slow, with thick but poor armour schemes, with essentially pop guns firing solid shot ammunition. Compared to a lot of the other nations, which typically have faster, more mobile tanks to start with, the low tier British experience can be very rough for newer players. It's a long haul of suffering, all the way up to around bath rating 8.7, where Britain arguably sort of becomes competitive. So with a large grind ahead of us lads, shall we jump into the pain? Honestly boys, sometimes I think we British really should have stuck to what we do best, making ships, trains, and arbitrary borders. We naturally start with rank 1, and for the British we actually have a pretty decent lineup in my opinion. The tanks are generally fast and fun to play, and while they lack armour, they are fitted with fast firing 40mm cannons, with some surprisingly high penetration rounds for the battle rating. The two main choices of ammunition for this gun is an APC-BC round, this is solid shot with 89mm of penetration, or an armour piercing high explosive round, with only 66mm of penetration, but well, this latter round contains an explosive filler, giving you much better post-pen damage. The reason I'm talking about the gun here instead of a specific vehicle is that we're going to be talking about the 40mm gun a lot, as it is the staple of pretty much the first two ranks of the British Tech Tree. And while it gives you a big advantage in the early battle ratings, it dramatically loses its potency as we head into rank 2, and becomes arguably the biggest weakness of those tanks. But, if you're familiar with British history in World War II, you know that we'll be using basically World War I equipment in a modern, moving war. Anyway, enough of the history lessons, let's get on with the video. Our first tank is the A-13 Mark I, the first of two reserve vehicles available. This tank is a cruiser, developed to do the job of the cavalry, as well as the job of a naval cruiser, basically exploiting weaknesses of a battle and detached solo cruising missions. The vehicle is decently fast for its battle rating, and it does have that high penetration 40mm cannon. The other reserve vehicle is the Tetrarch. This little light tank was entered into trials for a lightweight cruiser tank in the 1930s, but lost to the A13. Compared to that tank, it has the exact same gun, but it is a shorter profile, it's a lot sneakier, and it's kind of cute. Following on from the Tetrarch is the Daimler Scout car. This 4x4 would actually only leave British service in the 1960s, not bad for a vehicle that entered production in mid-1942. So, was it a good vehicle? Well, 
In real life, yes, as it was used for driving around Tunisia and Burma, basically shooting at locals armed with donkeys and sticks. But in War Thunder, where you can expect enemies with slightly more firepower, mm, not so much. My issue isn't really with the gun or the armor, but more the mobility. While you'd expect a wheeled chassis to give you a lot better top speed and flexibility, it also makes the tank very sluggish to drive. The biggest issue is the poor acceleration. While the top speed is impressive, actually getting up to speed is the issue. The turret traverse is also very slow, making it hard to snap to a target, which along with the poor acceleration and maneuverability, hurts the Daimler's ability to act as a scout or a light tank. It plays more like a tank destroyer, you can't really be aggressive with it, but again for its low battle rating, it's a decent little tank. Our first reserve vehicle, the A13 Mark I, wasn't particularly popular, both with troops or the army general staff, and a Mark II version was created. This mainly upgraded the frontal armour, jumping from 14mm to, wait for it boys, a whopping 30mm, and yes, that was sarcastic. Because of the jumping armour, we also jump in battle rating to 1.3. The armour increase isn't a game changer because most guns will penetrate 30mm just as easily as 14mm, so it doesn't affect the way you play the tank. We also have some American tanks in the British tech tree. In exchange for a rather big chunk of gold bullion, the United States kindly shipped us some Shermans. These were actually loved by the British troops, giving them the nickname Honey for their smooth ride in the rough desert conditions. The tank is armed with a 37mm gun, which is very comparable to the British 40mm. It's high pen, fast firing, with mediocre post pen performance. For some reason it sees a large jump in battle rating to 1.7, but with its high top speed and gun stabiliser, it makes for a very enjoyable little light tank, and is a personal highlight of rank 1 for me. As a direct upgrade we have the Stuart 3. Despite another large increase in battle rating to 2.3, not much has really changed here. The earlier Stuart does have a lower profile, fully welded turret, with nominally a better main gun. It's still 37mm in diameter, but boasts a whopping 1mm difference in penetration with its main gun round. Despite the rather uncalled for increase in battle rating, like the Stuart Mark 1, the Mark 3 is still a very fun tank to play. We then come to the first of many spags in the British tech tree, our self-propelled anti-aircraft gun. This is the light AA Mark 1. It's literally a Vickers Armstrong Mark 6 with four Beezer machine guns welded onto it. Even at battle rating 1.0, this thing is just underpowered. Trying to take out planes with rifle caliber machine guns just isn't a very enjoyable experience. War Thunder is apparently a World War II game, but with the light AA Mark 1, we're trying to roleplay as a World War I fighter. I personally wouldn't recommend this, or at least skip it as soon as you can. The follow-on SBAG is kind of making up for this, as we trade 4 rifle caliber machine guns for 250 cals. Not a bad trade in my opinion, but we also double the battle rating up to 2.0. The 50 cals at least covers a knockout punch against both the planes and the lightly armored tanks you are likely to be facing at this battle rating. The Staghound, like the Daimler, is also on a 4x4 chassis, giving it slightly better mobility than the AA Mark 1. Again though, like the Daimler, just be aware of the mediocre acceleration. We also have our first South African vehicle, the SARC Mark 4A. This is essentially a South African Daimler clone, a 4x4 chassis with a 40mm gun. It has noticeably better acceleration than the Daimler though, but shows the same poor turret traverse rate. The tank is also open topped, giving it very poor survivability, even at these lower battle ratings. You typically have much more cast at lower battle ratings, and just as much artillery. The Mark IV race is a surprisingly enjoyable little light tank at this battle rating, but just start praying to whatever god you believe in when you see a plane above you. Now boys, onto the premiums, and as a rule, I don't think it's ever worth buying a premium at rank 1. Rank 2 premiums are just as cheap and a lot better. Our first two premiums are essentially A13s. The first is a copy of the A13 Mark 1, costing 250 Golden Eagles, and the second is a premium A13 Mark 2, which at the time of recording costs around $24 on the Gaijin Marketplace. The former is a decent investment, but the latter, the Mark 2, is not. We also have two other premiums. The Electro 1 was a reward premium for the Battle of Arrakis event, and it combines the hull of a Tetrarch with a 3.75 inch howitzer. This tank was developed at the end of the Second World War, and was designed to reinforce British airborne troops. 
playing a similar battlefield role as the ASU-57 from the Soviet Tetri. The penetration of the howitzer's gun is impressive, but the high explosive round and the long reload speed does make it pretty hard to play in the fast moving, fast firing meta of low tier war thunder. And finally for rank 1, we have the Independent. No, it's not the rag of a communist newspaper here in Britain called the Independent, it's the Independent World War 1 clone tank. This was seen as groundbreaking when it was first developed, leading to a British officer being arrested for supplying a copy of the technical plans to the Germans. The plans also somehow found their way to the Russians, who used them to make the T-28 and the T-35, tanks which were so bad that Stalin probably also wanted the British officer arrested. But would it surprise you to find out that the British didn't like this vehicle? As you can see, it was way more of a World War I tank, fitted with four machine guns in smaller turrets, and it had a crew of eight men, making it a completely inefficient design. In War Thunder though, it moves surprisingly fast for a heavy tank, and with that eight men crew, it will keep you alive for quite a while, as it's hard to kill all eight crew members in a single hit. The firepower though, like all of the other rank 1 British vehicles, is a little underwhelming. Whereas the other British 40mm guns could at least boast of having high penetration, the 47mm gun on the Independent can only manage to penetrate 49mm of armour at point blank range. And with an explosive filler of 16 grams of lidite, it certainly isn't a post pen monster either. At a cost of 2,100 Golden Eagles, it's also a fairly expensive premium. The tank just isn't that good for grinding though boys, mainly as I've already said you can just buy a rank 2 for a lot cheaper amount and get a much better performing vehicle. The independent is as inefficient to buy in game as it was to operate in real life. And that's it for all the Tetri vehicles boys, generally the 1.3 lineup for the British is pretty decent, all of Britain's low tier tanks have high penetration guns which means you aren't going to run into anything you can't kill. And with the high mobility, you can usually also get around the map and surprise people. It's a shame that the Stuart Mark 1 is battery rating 1.7, as I wouldn't recommend up tiering to 1.7 with the other 1.3 vehicles, and the battery rating 2.3 Stuart Mark 3 is just a tragedy, as it doesn't have a lineup blur, but it is one of the most enjoyable British tanks to play. While rank 1 was pleasant enough, rank 2, unfortunately for us, is going to teach you what suffering really means. The tanks get much heavier and therefore slower, but we still have the 40mm cannon. Whilst it performed well at battery rating 1.3, at 2.7 and upwards, its penetration of 89mm certainly is no longer going to cut the mustard, and its 66mm of pen with its APHE is pretty much useless. Bear in mind here, we are pretty much using vehicles found in the North African campaign of World War II, the early stages of which were pretty rough for us Brits, and it's no real different for our experience here in War Thunder. The high power cannons of Panzer 3s and 4s, as well as the trolley armour of the Soviet tanks, is going to be a right thorn in the balls for any aspiring British man. In real life, the British utilised the French technique of running away, and then garrisoning the strong defensive position of El Alamein, in the end though, it was the American imported Sherman's Desert Air Force and the British Howitzer batteries that ultimately sealed the fate of Rommel's Africa Corps. But for us here in War Thunder, we don't get any of that stuff. What we get are tanks like the Crusader Mark II. This is a direct evolution from the A-13 seen in the previous rank. It has vaguely the same turret design, as well as the same 40mm cannon. But what is different is the hull. It has a new suspension, which doesn't matter in terms of gameplay, but the armour is actually weaker for some reason, dropping from 30mm down to 20mm. The battle rating also jumps up to 2.7, allowing us to face 3.7 tanks. If you want to know what fighting a T-34 with the 40mm gun is like on this tank, go up to the biggest man you can find, insult his mother to his face, and then imagine his clenched fist repeatedly hitting your head at high velocity. That pretty much accurately represents the state of your crew the second a T-34 spots you as your 20mm of frontal armour isn't going to do shit against his 3 inch gun. Fear not though dear viewer, as the British realised how shit the Mark II was, and introduced the Mark III. This tank was the result of a call for a better armed so called heavy cruiser tank. The well proven 6 pounder anti tank gun was developed to fit into a tank chassis, similar to the fate of the 17 pounder in a few years time. The addition of the 6 pounder to the crusader hull, as well as an engine upgrade, 
makes the Mark III a surprisingly good vehicle, as you now have over 120 mm of penetration, allowing you to much easily deal with the heavy tanks in an up tier. And as long as you aim for the turret cheeks, you can even knock out T-34s. The Mark III does have some drawbacks though. The reload is now a lot longer than the 40mm armed variants, and the battle rating has been increased up to battle rating 3.0. Not a huge increase from 2.7, but it means it gets forced out of the very good British 2.7 standard lineup. What's that? You thought we were finished with the 40mm 2 pounder? Well, you're dead wrong. The suffering never ends in rank 2. We still have some other tanks from North African fame to go through first. Probably the most iconic tank the British fielded in North Africa was the Matilda. While being armed with the mediocre 40mm, it actually has heavy tank levels of armour. The front and sides are around 75mm thick, all whilst being at battery rating 2.7. The Matilda is a very tough opponent to crack, which is partially responsible for the tank's biggest weakness, its god awful mobility, which as you'll see in the rest of this video, is a reoccurring theme for the British. The Matilda is so slow that the battle is probably almost certainly over by the time you get to an enemy's side of the map. Overall though, the Matilda is a rather forgettable experience in my opinion. Its armour is appreciated, but the lack of mobility makes the 40mm even more insufferable to play, as the gun lacks long range damage, and we can't even flank and spank to make up for our mediocre gun. Other than tight urban maps where you don't really have long sight lines, the Matilda is a pretty bad tank in my opinion, and I would avoid it. A tank very similar to the Matilda is the Valentine. Over 8,000 of these bad boys were produced. The first variant, the Mark 1, is armed with, you guessed it, the 2 pounder. Its battery rating of 2.3 does mean the gun is still useful, but again, like the Matilda, the low speed is a real deal breaker. The armor of the Valentine is also much weaker than that of the Matilda, going from 75mm of the latter to 60mm on the Valentine. After the lessons learned from the North African campaign, the British needed better guns. And as we saw with the Crusader Mark III, they chose the 6 pounder. This was high velocity and dealt with German tanks very well, but it lacked an effective explosive round. Because of this, and the changing nature of war, away from tanks fighting other tanks to mainly being used for infantry fire support, the British decided to bore out the 6 pounder barrels, going from 57mm diameter to a new 75mm size. This was done mainly for ammunition commonality with the Americans, as a 75mm diameter allowed British tanks to now use the same rounds fired by the Sherman. But the bigger diameter barrel, without an increase in barrel length, led to quite a drastic drop in muzzle velocity compared to the 6 pounder. This means the 6 pounder is actually a lot better at killing tanks. I apologise for this little history lesson, but it is important for the British going forward in this rank. After the Valentine Mark 1, we then have the Mark 11. Sitting at battery rating 2.7, it's armed with the low velocity 75mm cannon. This gives it a minor boost in penetration compared to the 40mm variant, but gives us a huge increase in post pen damage. The APC BC round can pen 100mm at point blank range, the same as the early Shermans, but unlike the Sherman, this tank has no explosive filler in its ammunition. So while we have the same punch as a Sherman tank, we certainly do not have any of that well respected American bang. We then have the Valentine Mark 9 which actually was produced before the Mark 11, but this tank was fitted with the 6 pounder gun, giving it substantially better firepower than the Mark 11, hence the bump in battery rating to 3.0. The 6 pounder again can penetrate 122mm at point blank range, 20mm more than the 75mm. Like that gun it also lacks an explosive filled shell, so like all of the British vehicles so far, post pen damage is going to be pretty poor. Overall though, all three of the Valentines have never been amazing tanks. Like the Matilda, they are limited by their limited mobility. They are slow, with relatively poor survivability, so you combine the worst aspects of both the Matilda and the Crusader. Following on directly from the Valentines, we have the good old Churchill Mark I. Like the Valentine, this was an infantry support vehicle, so right away we know the tank is going to be slow and cumbersome. To carry out the tank's intended infantry support role, the tank was equipped with a secondary controlled 75mm howitzer. The high explosive round it fires can only penetrate 10mm of armour, but a battery rating 3.3, it can be used against some of the lighter tanks roaming around the battlefield. We also have a turret, fitted with, you guessed it, another 2 pounder. This Churchill is very forgettable in my opinion. Despite having pretty good protection, it's over 100mm thick on the turret, and the upper glazes is still 88mm thick. 
while it does give you better frontal protection than the Matilda, it's a huge cost in battery rating, jumping up to 0.7 or jumping up to 3.3. And that really is the sole reason for this tank being such a terrible vehicle. The 40mm gun at 3.3 is totally out of its league. And then combined with the fact that tank has pretty terrible survivability and absolutely no mobility, it makes this tank totally forgettable and I would strongly recommend you not playing this tank. If you recommend your sanity, that is. Now, if we imagine a Crusader Mark II, but on wheels, what we basically get is the Sark Mark VI. This is an 8x8 chassis with a very high profile, but it has surprisingly good maneuverability, despite it looking rather goofy in my opinion. As I said, it plays basically the same as a Crusader. You're a complete glass cannon who has to rely on flanking to get good killing shots. This is mainly because, and I'm sure you can already guess what I'm about to say, it's armed with the infamous 2-pounder and sits at battery rating 2.3. Like the Crusader Mark III though, the Sark did receive an upgrade to the 6-pounder gun, giving it all of the benefits of the Mark III Crusader. The anti-aircraft performance is also improved due to the addition of a 50 cal on the roof. This is nothing special, but it's a pretty big bump in firepower, and this vehicle is by far the best mobility option if you want to play this battery rating. It's surprisingly fast and combined with the 6-pounder gun, it is a very competent little light tank at the battery rating of 3.3. I suppose now is a good time to talk about probably the most iconic British cruiser tank of World War II, the Cromwell. We have two versions available here, but thankfully none with the 40mm gun. The first, the Mark V, comes in at battery rating 3.3 and is armed with the 75mm gun that we saw on the Valentine Mark 11. It's very mobile and can still pen over 100mm of armour, but it doesn't come close to the performance of the Cromwell Mark 1, as this version is fitted with the 6-pounder. But Gaijin hates fun, so they moved this tank up to battery rating 3.7, moving it out of the arguably very powerful 3.3 British lineup. Both variants of the Cromwell use solid shot AP rounds, lacking explosive filler, so shot placement is key. In fact, both of these tanks have similar playstyles to the previous cruisers. They have fairly poor armour schemes with around 2.5 inches of armour, and again, like the previous cruisers, they rely on the skill of user in order to achieve good results. So naturally, these tanks don't fit well with American mains. Finally, for our last medium tank of rank 2, we have the Sherman. This gives the British Tetri two things. First, we get a main tank with a 50 caliber machine gun. This is useful for shooting at those annoying little bastards in Stukas, thinking their hands rudel. But more importantly for the Tetri, we have the addition of an explosive filled shot. This is the first time the British have decent penetration, as well as good post-pen damage. If only all British tanks were like this, rank 2 may actually be worth the suffering. Apart from that though, it's basically just a standard American M4A1 Sherman. At battery rating 3.7, it is a little lonely. The only other vehicle we have is the Mark 1 Cromwell, but I'd still say keeping at 3.3, it's still a better lineup in my opinion, and you don't get up to to those scurry 4.7 matches. After covering the light, medium and heavy tanks, let's finish with the good old tank destroyers and the anti-aircraft vehicles. We'll start with the Archer, and I'm going to say it lads, the Archer is kind of a good looking tank. It has a charm to it that I can't quite put my finger on. But, in the War Thunder community, there's only one word to describe this tank. Shite. As you may have noticed, the tank is mounted backwards. The British couldn't find a way to mount the long barreled 17 pounder onto an existing chassis, so they made this thing. They used a hole from the Valentines which we spoke about earlier and basically chopped the turret off and welded the 17 pounder in backwards. To be fair this was a stopgap measure used by the British Tank Corps and it will be a stopgap for War Thunder plays as well as no one plays this thing as it purely is just shite. As we saw in the Valentines section that tank isn't exactly a sprinter so having to encounter an enemy, do a 180 and then try and get your gun on them isn't exactly an efficient way of getting kills. This tank forces you to take up a static position on the battlefield, something which isn't really that common in War Thunder, as most battles are conquest style missions, relying on both teams being aggressive in one to three capture points. There is no role for defensive tanks in War Thunder really, except in niche parts of an in-game battle. But for battle rating 2.7, it's gone, given you can get it onto target, allows you to penetrate pretty much anything you see, with its 190mm of penetration. A tank that is slightly more functional, but would also be described by the War Thunder community as shite, is the Churchill Gun Carrier. This vehicle was developed alongside the Archer, 
but was also deemed, this time officially by the British government, as shite. The tank is incredibly heavy, with a gun lacking in both penetration and damage. The archer's gun, when you could at least get it onto target, could penetrate 190mm of armour, whereas the gun carry can only manage 111mm. The archer is battery rating 2.7 and the gun carrier is 3.0. Not really too sure why Gaijin thought this thing is better than the archer. I guess having a front facing gun is now a buff, I don't really know. Anyway, both of these vehicles are widely despised amongst British players. I'd stay clear of these two tanks, they generally are just painful to play. Our last tank destroyer and the best of the three is the Achilles. This is a British modification of the M10 Wolverine. Like the Archer, it uses the long barreled 17 pounder, giving it fantastic firepower. This one's actually mounted in a turret, so you don't have to do a drift or a 180 to get it onto target, which gives us an actual functioning tank destroyer in the British tech tree. Thank you, Lend Lease. Finally, we can put that 190mm of penetration to good work. As I said, this gun is easily the strongest gun at battery rating 3.3, allowing you to cleave through all of the Soviet T-34 rushes with relatively ease. While the firepower is definitely improved though, the turret drive moves at the speed of a tectonic plate, meaning you will still need to more than likely rotate the hull to get the gun onto target. Just like the Archer though, the poor turret drive does dissuade you from being aggressive, and you end up kind of being forced into a passive playstyle. That being said though, I take this into my 3.3 lineup as it does give you a serious amount of firepower and a huge firepower advantage over the Soviet mains for example because they rely on the Rama and this thing just goes straight through it. So we've covered all our tanks but a good lineup just isn't tanks, we also need some anti-aircraft vehicles and we have two in rank 2. The first is the AECAA, this is a little 4x4 armoured car, it started life with, you guessed it, a 2 pounder gun. But thankfully in War Thunder, they haven't added this variant to the game yet. There was also a variant with the 6 pounder and the 75mm quick firing. Also not added to the tech tree, but one is a premium. What Gaijin chose to add though, was the late war anti-aircraft variant. We lose the fully armoured turret, but we gain two 20mm Orlikan cannons. The rate of fire is pretty low, and the muzzle velocity is also pretty poor. Noticeably a lot lower than the 900m per second of the Whirlwind. This means it's actually quite hard to shoot down enemy planes with, as low muzzle velocity makes it very hard to lead enemy planes, especially at medium altitudes and ranges. The AEC is only really good at taking out enemies that are flying straight towards you. We also have the Crusader AA. It has a similar life story to the AEC. It's an old Crusader hull, but this time we get a 40mm L60 Bofors gun. The rate of fire is drastically lower than that of the 20mm armed AEC, but we gain a lot more penetration. While the 40mm does have better muzzle velocity, due to the lower mass of lead being put into the air, actually hitting an incoming plane is pretty hard, so newer players should probably stick with the AEC. But the Crusader is theoretically better against other enemy tanks, kind of being played like the Soviet ZSU-57-2, but a lot less potent. The Crusader is also battery rating 3.0 meaning our 2.7 lineup is left without an effective anti-aircraft vehicle. Now moving on to the premiums, and we actually have some good picks here. The M3 Lee, known in the British service as the Grant, has the excellent 75mm mounted in the hull. The British experience of using these guns in Tunisia led directly to them developing the 75mm quick firing used in so many of the British tanks I've covered. The Grant also has decent penetration with its gun mounted in the turret on top, and it's a pretty effective premium at battery rating 2.7. The only problem is that it's bought on the Gaijin marketplace and is relatively expensive for a rank 2 premium. Luckily though we also have two others, both of which are battery rating 2.7. We have the Matilda Hedgehog. Imagine a Matilda with enhanced firepower. You're probably thinking of a 6 pounder or a 75mm armed Matilda. Well, the British decided to put Hedgehog depth charge mines on the back of it. Yeah, quite silly to be honest. In War Thunder, these are a huge gimmick, as they cannot be aimed both in range or windage. Instead, you have to point your hull in the general direction of the enemy, and then manually estimate the range to target. Aiming your gun up and down will alter the angle of the launcher, but there is no way to do this reliably or accurately. Essentially, it's just a premium Matilda, which isn't a terrible thing in a down tier, but you still have a deficit of mobility and firepower. Another tank that exceeds in a down tier is your Crusader Mark II, known in-game as the Saint. 
Again, just a premium copy and paste Mark II with nothing special added onto it. It gives you a cheap way of grinding out the British early tech tree without having to pay a large repair bill. I'd recommend this tank for newer players, not based on its amazing performance, but if you can master this tank, you will do well in all subsequent British vehicles. And finally boys, the last vehicle we're going to be looking at today, or at least in this rank, is the Cromwell 5 RP3. Like the Matilda Hedgehog, the Brits cracked out their acetylene torches and welded some mountings for the large RP3 aircraft rockets onto the side of the turret. It's said that the RP3 rockets are the equivalent to a high explosive round from a 6 inch cruiser gun, which probably would be incredibly effective against infantry, but because War Thunder isn't an infantry game, these rockets are largely useless in my opinion. It's largely a gimmick anyway, as you're unable to aim these rockets in terms of elevation as they are fixed onto the turret. It makes them pretty much impossible to aim at medium ranges. If you do manage to hit an enemy though, as long as they're a light tank or lightly armoured, the 5 kilos of TNT filler does allow you to penetrate 44mm of armour. They're not going to do anything against the more heavily armoured mediums or even the lightly armoured heavies. But against some of the lighter tanks roaming around the battlefields, they will certainly get torn to pieces. This premium would have been much better if it used the Mark 1 chassis and got the 6 pounder gun. Instead, we only have the 75mm. A premium Cromwell Mark 1 with the 6 pounder sitting at battery rating 3.7 would have been an incredibly good all round grind for the British tech tree. But the Cromwell RP3 at battery rating 3.3 is still a decent pick. And it goes well with the 3.3 lineup which is kind of meta at this battery rating, at least for the British. Well lads, we're finally through the dreaded rank 2. While the main lineups of this battery rating are going to be 2.7 with the Crusaders and the Matildas, as well as 3.3, we still do have that good 3.7 lineup as well if you want to risk the 4.7 up tier. But compared to the other big nations like America, Germany and the Soviets, those guys all have well-defined 2.7 and 3.7 lineups that are much more meta defining than the British versions. So while there certainly is fun to be had in rank 2 of the British tech tree, you're probably going to have a lot more fun in the other nations. The third rank of the British tech tree represents the mid to late war for the British. We start seeing the famous 17 pounder as well as all the vehicles produced in response to the failures of the earlier generations of British tanks. While this rank is rather small, it starts strong and sweet, but turns very bitter as we jump to War Thunder's middle battery rating. Let's start with another South African high-speed runner. And no, I'm not talking about a Johannesburg criminal, I'm talking about the Concept 3, Britain's only light tank in rank 3. Coming in at battery rating 4.3, I've said 3 now, 3 times, well that just makes it even worse, that's 4 times in a row. Anyway, it's 4.3 and we have a fast scout vehicle with a very powerful gun, capable of penetrating over 150mm of armour, combining high mobility with a hard hitting gun. There are some downsides though, the vehicle has poor gun handling, the suspension is very bouncy and the turret reverse rate is very slow, both of which make it very clumsy for brawling. So whilst it's a powerful vehicle, it's best utilised as a long range scout, staying far away from the front lines, picking off enemies with your fantastic long range gun. A tank on the complete opposite end of the spectrum would be the Churchill 3. This thing has neither firepower or mobility. While the tank now has the 6 pounder cannon from the previous rank, its battery rating has jumped up to a ridiculous 4.0. In my opinion, this nullifies the jump in firepower as we now see the scurrier 5.0 battery rating vehicles. Facing the 4.7 Soviet lineup in the Churchill 3 is particularly painful, as tanks such as the KV-85 have far better armour, firepower and mobility. Like the other Churchills, both past and present, it is over tiered significantly with a completely underwhelming gun. Possibly the best Churchill in the entire game, which still means it's pretty terrible, but it's the Churchill NA-75. This was a modification carried out to a Churchill Mark IV during the North African campaign, hence the NA designation. Some plucky Brit went and stole a 75mm gun from a knocked out Sherman and stuck it in the Churchill's turret. In real life this was a massive bodge job as the gun was mounted upside down and the loader now had to feed the gun left handed. Luckily for us though, loaders in War Thunder can't voice their complaints or join a union so it has very little negative effect in game. 
The Churchill NA75 does have a positive effect though on my will to live, as it is probably the only fun variant of the Churchill to play. This is mainly due to the fact that we now have a round with good post pen damage, combining decent penetration with great post pen damage. One notable downside though, while we do use the Sherman's gun, we do not get the shot stabilizer commonly associated with the Sherman. This reduces the Churchill's ability to brawl and fire on the move, even though this tank is folded at battery rating 4.3, I'd still recommend playing this tank as it does add a big bunch in firepower to the 4.3 British lineup. We then come on to the last Tech Tree Churchill, thank god, and unlike the NA75, the Mark 7 really is a pain to play. Like many of the other British vehicles in the late war period, its 6 gun pounder was bored out to the 75mm, which nuked its ability to punch through armour plate. Just a reminder, the 75mm gun is essentially the same gun found on the Shermans. We fired the M61 round on the Churchill Mark 7, which can penetrate just over 100mm of armour. Bear in mind, the Americans got access to this tank at 3.3, or the same gun at 3.3, whereas the Churchill Mark 7 is battery rating 4.7, so we have worse penetration than the 6 pounder variant of the Churchill, and a huge jump up in battery rating to go with it. So this tank is just worth worse in every way conceivable. So what do we get for that higher battery rating? Well, it certainly isn't firepower or mobility. Instead, the reason for the higher battery rating is the increase in armor protection. The armor jumps from 89mm from the previous Churchills to 152mm on the Mark 7. Not a bad boost in protection, you say. But just remember, this is 4.7. The additional armor should protect you from most Soviet and American guns at your own battery rating, but it certainly isn't going to protect you from the German guns. And in a full up tier to 5.7, you're basically just going to be the laughing stock of the team. I think you can agree that all of the tanks we've looked at so far in this rank have been a little bit shite, and the British government also agreed. And the British were desperately searching for a new generation of British tanks. After learning a lot of harsh lessons in North Africa, the Department of War was desperately trying to close the firepower gap between the British and German tanks. The idea for this next generation of tanks was to mount the fantastic 17 pounder found on the Achilles and Archer onto a more mobile, fully rotated turret cruiser type vehicle. To cut the story short, all the designs the British had were pretty shite. This was mainly due to the current cruiser tanks all having rather small turret rings. So instead, the 17 pounder was bodged once again into the Sherman's turret. While on paper this sounds stupid, in reality it created one of the most famous tanks of World War II, the Sherman Firefly. Like the Churchill Mark 7, it has a battery rating of 4.7. While the armour and mobility of a Sherman is pretty poor at this battery rating, the additional firepower of the 76mm does give you the ability to penetrate pretty much everything you will come across, including the Tiger tanks at 5.7 and 6.0, as long as they aren't angling. The Panther, granted, is a tougher nut to crack due to its sloped frontal glacis, but you can still go through the gun mantler. The Firefly also loses the stabilizer commonly found on the regular American Shermans, so while these tanks do have much better firepower, in most engagements, especially on tight urban maps, the American variant with HE rounds are probably going to be a lot better for brawling. Being up close and personal kind of negates the need for the high power 17 pounder, it's also worth bearing in mind that this tank still only uses solid shot APC-BC rounds. We do not get the APDS rounds found on the late war Fireflies in real life for some reason. The last good vehicle in this rank, in my opinion, is the A-30 Avenger. While in real life it was a tank destroyer used by the Royal Artillery, in War Thunder it is a battery rating 4.7 medium tank. It's basically an unlengthened Cromwell hull with one additional road wheel either side. This utterly nukes the tank's slow speed maneuverability, as it makes the hull traverse very slow. Apart from turning though, the acceleration and top speed is surprisingly good. The Avenger has an open top turret, covered with canvas to protect the crew from the elements. This obviously makes the tank very vulnerable to high explosive rounds, close air support and artillery. Apart from the lack of armour and mediocre mobility, the firepower is fantastic. You have the same great 17 pounder, with the same great rounds. You don't get a coaxial machine gun though, which means it can be hard to mark targets, but apart from that, no complaints. After we leave the 4.7 vehicles, we move on to the 5.3. And these tanks make you feel very, very upset. They're just not very fun anymore. They used to be a staple of the British tech tree and one of the best lineups in War Thunder. 
but for some reasons, probably because a lot more vehicles have been added to other nations, 5.3 is decidedly quite weak for the British now. The first vehicle we have is the Challenger. This is basically the exact same in length front hull as the Avenger, as well as the same gun. The difference is we now have a fully armoured turret, which as I'm sure you'll agree, does make the tank look very, very stupid. You may be asking then, why the jump up to battery rating of 5.3? But it's mainly due to the addition of APDS to our ammunition loadout. Granted, these do give you over 200mm of penetration, but they have pretty poor post bend damage. And after the recent changes to sub-caliber ammunition, a lot of the APDS does now just shatter when you fire it against angled armour. Despite having the sable round, I generally still do take along the APCBC or solid shot full caliber ammunition, as while it doesn't have as much penetration, it generally has much better spalling and post pen damage in my opinion, so it is a generally more consistent round to use. The vehicle's battery rating of 5.3 does seem quite high to me. It's basically just a clone of an Avenger with a slightly better round. I wouldn't recommend people really playing this tank. You obviously have to grind it to progress in the tech tree, but it isn't very fun to play in my opinion. And finally, the last medium tank of rank 3, the good old Comet. The previous two vehicles, the Challenger and Avenger, both failed to live up to British expectations. So again, the chassis of the Cromwell was used as a basis, and a new turret was designed to house the 77mm quick firing gun. This was a modified 17 pounder with around 10% less power, but it had much less recoil and a drastically reduced size, allowing it to fit into a smaller turret. Apparently size doesn't matter, a huge relief to me personally. While the Comet certainly isn't going to be winning any awards for survivability, it has a very powerful cannon, as well as the same APDS round capable of penetrating over 200mm of armour. One huge L though is the reverse speed. Only being capable of going 3km per hour in reverse is an absolute ball aching game. The turret reverse is also surprisingly slow, giving the Comet very bad gun handling. It's hard to swing the gun onto target quickly, meaning it fails as a medium tank in my opinion. It plays much more like a heavy tank, despite having none of the armour and barely having the firepower. And that lack of a reverse speed completely negates your ability to brawl. While I have fond memories of the Comet from back in the day before Gaijin nerfed the sub caliber penetrators, those days are unfortunately long gone, and the Comets are pretty painful for me to play in-game. Co possibly could just be a skill issue, but a lot of people have been complaining about it, so hopefully it's not just me being shit. But quickly moving on, before I have to face my own ineptitude at playing War Thunder, let's talk about the Spags. And we have three in the third rank, none of which are particularly amazing to play in the anti-aircraft role. The first vehicle is the Crusader SBAA. Towards the end of the war, the Crusader tanks in service with the British were pretty much redundant, and some of them were transformed into anti-aircraft vehicles. Their main guns were removed and fitted with two Orlikon Mark I guns. The same weapons found on the battle rating 3.0 AEC AA. The only differences between the two vehicles being the increased armour protection of the Crusader hull and turret and the Crusader having a better turret traverse rate as well. Which in fairness does give you a huge advantage in the anti-aircraft role as you can track enemy aircraft a lot easier. Following on from the Crusader we have two South African vehicles. The first is the Yistavak. This thing is hideous and I cringe every time I look upon it. It's so ugly that it almost certainly has a job on the Netflix writing staff. It's basically a truck with a 20mm gun welded on top. As goofy as this thing looks, it actually shot down quite a few Angolan MiGs during the South African border war. The reason for its high battle rating of 4.3 is the muzzle velocity of its gun, making it very easy to aim at long range. It also has an armour piercing belt which can terrorise weakly armoured vehicles. The mobility is also pretty good, allowing you to zip around the battlefield and pretending you're an extra for a Mad Max movie. Not a bad little vehicle for a battle rating 4.0. Just be aware you can't fire the gun directly forwards due to the cab being in the way. And finally, the last SBAG is the Bosvark. This vehicle adds two more wheels onto the Yustavark and doubles the guns. This is a 6x6 truck with a captured ZSU-23-2 mounted on the bed. The Soviet twin barrel gun gives you an amazing fire rate and a relatively high muzzle velocity making you a terror of the sky within a range of around 1.5 kilometers. Unlike the Yustavark, which is small and nippy, the Bosvark is much larger and feels very sluggish to drive. So while the Bosvark is a much better self-propelled anti-aircraft gun, it loses the flexibility of its South African brother, 
It also has a much higher battery rating of 5.3, a huge jump up from the Eustavac's own battery rating of 4.0. And that covers all of our rank 3 tech tree vehicles. Now let's take a look at our premiums. Our first premium vehicle is actually a premium copy and paste of the Achilles from rank 2. This tank is only available around the D-Day anniversary event, around the first week of June each year. So keep an eye out for this tank, as it is a very nice premium indeed. Being a rank 3, it allows you to grind up all of the vehicles up to rank 4, all whilst being a battery rating 3.3 tank, meaning you can grind all the way up to battery rating 7.3 with a 3.3 Achilles, a solid choice of a premium in my opinion. We also have a few more copy and pastes, we have the Polish Sherman Firefly, the Churchill Crocodile and the Comet Iron Duke. All of these are nice to own, but only the Polish Firefly is a great grinder in my opinion, as it allows you to learn the playstyle of most of the British tanks. Another vehicle available to everyone is the AC4. This is an Australian medium tank known as the Sentinel. This version has been upgunned to the 17 pounder and sits at battery rating 5.3 but it doesn't get the APDS round found on the other 5.3 British vehicles. I assume this was because the British didn't export APDS rounds to Australia or something, but the APCBC rounds on the AC are still good enough for most targets at close range. While it's a decent vehicle, due to it being in the cursed 5.3 lineup, I wouldn't recommend spending your money on the AC4. And finally we have the quick firing 3.7 inch ram. This is an M3 Lee chassis with a British 94mm anti-aircraft gun on it acting in the same role as the German 88mm half-track. This was a reward premium a couple of years ago, but it's still relatively cheap on the Gaijin marketplace. The gun is pretty powerful, capable of penetrating just over 200mm of armour, and with its large bore diameter, it also creates a large amount of spalling, dealing both good damage and a high level of penetration. The rate of fire is also pretty good, allowing you to pump a lot of lead downrange quickly. The obvious downside is that the fact that this tank is open-topped you are very easy to kill with just machine guns, and especially from closer support and artillery. While the ram is a good bit of fun, it isn't a great grinder in my opinion, and it also sits at 5.3, so again, pretty cursed. Rank 3 is a funny old time for the British Tech Tree. The tanks sitting at 4.7 are very strong. I'd say battery rating 4.7 for the British is second only to the powerhouse that is the 4.7 Soviet lineup. The KV-85, Tismar and the ITP are very strong competitors indeed, but I think the British are in a strong second place in terms to them. The strength of this lineup is undoubtedly due to the 17 pounders fantastic penetration and post pen damage, allowing you to lol pen most opponents. However, at battery rating 5.3, your firepower advantage is largely gone, as the spam of German 75 and 88mm cannons take centre stage, where the high amounts of explosive filler makes a 17 pounder look like 2-2 long rifle. Or as you kids say these days, the British really fell off at 5.3. The fourth rank of the British tech tree is very small, and historically, at least in War Thunder's history, rank 4 used to be very competitive. The Centurions used to be at battery rating 6.7, with APDS and gun stabilizers. But then, the German main started seething and moulding, and ever since, the mid-ranked British tanks have been receiving nerf after nerf. The Centurions have been moved from 6.7, now up to 7.7, and the Centurion Mark 10, which we'll cover later, has now been moved to 8.0 for some reason. On top of these battery rating changes, we also had the real shatter nerfs, meaning most APDS rounds are now pretty much just as useless as APCR. But boys and girls, a tank that could never claim to be good was the Centurion Mark 1. Its battery rating of 6.0 meant it never had a decent lineup, and it still uses the unstabilized 17 pounder. The tank was also recently increased up to 6.3, which is just adding insult to injury to be honest. I have no idea how Gaijin decides to change these battery ratings. It's almost as if the devs don't play their own game. That being said though, the playstyle of the Centurion Mark 1 is the foundation for pretty much all of the vehicles remaining in this tech tree. It has strong frontal armour but below average mobility. That being said, I would strongly recommend all players to skip this tank. It really isn't enjoyable to play at all. While the Centurion was nothing special, in 1948, the British developed a truly godlike tank, the Centurion Mark III. The Mark III added a gun stabiliser as well as a new turret, fitted with the incredibly powerful 84mm 20 pounder gun. This gun is a big step over the 17 pounder found on the previous tank, 
giving us very high penetration APCBC and APDS rounds. Granted, the APDS rounds still are pretty gimped after the nerfs, but you can still spank the Germans with the solid shot. Just watch out for the Tiger 2s, as they are pretty much immune to your gun frontally, unless you risk loading that APDS, having it shatter, and looking like a right twat. The armor though of the Centurion Mark III is generally pretty good against conventional rounds, but with everyone cheating now at 7.7 .7 using CheetahFS, the armor of the Centurion Mark III is only really reliable in a down tier. Speaking of which, let's talk about the biggest weakness of the Centurions, the up tier. We can now face 8.7s in this tank, which frankly is retarded. Again, Guardian doesn't, the Guardian devs don't play their own game. Trying to face a T55 AM1 with a Centurion Mark III, very, very painful to play. The other downside of the Centurion is again, the time old fashioned weakness of all British tanks, the mobility. The Centurions are just the new sick men of rank four, a once mighty and fearsome opponent, reduced to basically a lapping stock. Not very based or angle pilled at all, and sadly this is pretty much the same conclusion that can be said about most of the other British tanks around this rank and battle rating. Sticking with the post-war theme, let's cover the Charioteer. This again uses the Cromwell chassis for some reason, but mounts the 84mm from the Centurion Mark III. I'm not sure why they didn't just use comet hulls, but the British government making retarded decisions is basically a national pastime at this rate. While the tank has the firepower associated with the 84mm, we certainly do not have the gun handling found on the Centurion Mark III. The smaller turret ring of the charioteer meant that the stabilizer couldn't be fitted, and it also led to the deletion of a loader, meaning that this tank only has a crew of three men. Not exactly ideal for survivability, what makes this even worse is that we can only reverse again at a speed of 3 km per hour. Even though they didn't use the Comet hull, they still have this major Comet weakness. Again, British government being retarded. The old tradition of British officers seemingly not running being taken a little too literally as well. Like, what is the point of only having a 3 km per hour reverse speed? Again, it's battery rating 6.3, and like the Centurion Mark 1, it leaves quite a lot to be desired. But the tank does have a good top speed and that hard hitting gun. I play this tank more as a light scout vehicle, nipping around the map and shooting enemies in the side. Following on from the charioteer, we have the FV4202. This is kind of known in War Thunder as the Chieftain prototype, but it wasn't really a prototype, more of a series of proof of concepts. Most notably, the driver is basically lying down, almost certainly having nightmares about the Eustavark. The fact the driver is taking a nap does allow the height of the tank to be a lot lower, making you a lower profile target compared to the other Centurions. It does inherit the poor reverse speed of the Charioteer unfortunately, so you won't be able to rush off into the enemy's spawn and then nip back down into cover. You won't in fact be able to nip off anywhere really, as this tank uses the Meteorite engine, a V8 modification of the V12 Meteor, so we have even less horsepower than the previous models of Centurions. So while the FV4202 is lighter than previous Centurions, it is still a slow vehicle by medium tank standards. We now turn to the Chonky Boys, the tank destroyers. Again, arguably built for a war that never materialised. Up first is the Tortoise, and I wasn't kidding about being chunky. This thing weighs 81 tonnes. Yeah, tactical flexibility isn't really possible in this tank. That weight of course was used to up armour the vehicle. Frontally, even Tiger 2s will struggle to penetrate you even from point blank range. The major weak spot though is the twin machine gun turret on the top of the tank. It's only 100mm thick and any APHE round will be able to punch through here and its bursting charge will splash down into the crew compartment, killing pretty much all the crew members. The tank does house a 94mm 32 pounder cannon though, giving you substantial firepower. It's basically the equivalent of the German long barreled 88mm. The guns have similar muzzle velocities as well as penetration ranges, but the British gun of course doesn't have any explosive filler, meaning the gun is a lot less reliable for doing damage. It's also obviously mounted in an incredibly heavy tank destroyer chassis without a traversable turret, meaning the tortoise has very limited use on the battlefield. While the tortoise is one of those meme vehicles that you often see getting requested, such as the mouse, it doesn't really have any place in War Thunder matches to be honest. You are much better in a lighter tank with a medium velocity gun such as the Charioteer. The 94mm gun is a little bit redundant, especially on such a useless hull. A much better vehicle in my opinion, and certainly much more flexible, is the FV4005. 
This was another case of the British Army shitting themselves looking at the IS-3 spam in the Berlin parades and they wanted a gun that was capable of defeating 6 inches of armour sloped at 60 degrees at a range of 2,000 yards. Naturally, the British designed the largest tank gun to ever be fielded, the 183mm L4A1. Like the Carnarvon, the tank for which the gun was designed was never produced and the FV4002 was merely a testbed using a centurion hull. The FV is battery rating 6.3 and faces a wide array of enemies. Thankfully the tank plays very well, but it has large limitations. It utterly lacks turret armour and is probably better accurately described as a gun house rather than a turret. The gun really is the only selling point of the vehicle. A 7.2 inch shell filled with high explosive really does ruin the day of some 5 foot 2 Soviet tanker. Being able to penetrate over 220mm of armour at all ranges and angles does come in handy, but we trade a large amount of alpha damage for a long reload, terrible armour and piss poor mobility. Another derp gun recently added to the British tech tree is the M109A1. This is a long bowed variant of the American howitzer with increased muzzle velocity. It isn't very remarkable to be honest, featuring a very long reload and very poor turret traverse rates, making it quite hard to use in tight urban areas making it notably weaker than a lot of the other derp vehicles found around this battle rating. It utilises a high explosive round with 54mm of penetration, which is pretty much quite underwhelming. It doesn't really compare that well to other vehicles. The FV4005 for example outcompetes it in every way imaginable. The only really reason that this thing fits in the British tech tree is that it's another addition for the 6.3 lineup. Other than that though, I'd recommend skipping this tank. The Conway is similar in appearance to the FV4005, but instead of a high caliber chemical shell, it uses a high caliber sub caliber APDS projectile, which sounds strange to say, but it's basically a 120mm L1A2 cannon. This was a proof of concept for the Conqueror, or at least the Conqueror's gun, and it has a whopping great big APDS round, capable of penetrating over 480mm of armour. While the shattering effect was bad with 84mm guns, the APDS on this gun is as strong as ever for some reason. It's as if Gaijin only nerfed the like 76mm and below guns for some reason. Because this gun still hits like a train. It lol pens pretty much everything you come across, even the Soviet heavies, which give German mains nightmares. They're basically just paper tigers against this tank though. Like the FE4005, we have the exact same downsides. It's a slow chassis with no armors to speak of, and with its battery rating of 7.0, it again is quite lonely. There's no point up tiering this tank to battery rating 7.7 .7, as you may as well just take the Conqueror out itself. We then move on to the only SBAA in rank 5, the Skink. This thing is basically a Canadian monstrosity mounting four 20mm Porsten cannons. In general it's a decent little spag but it lacks the fire density of something like the Whirlwind, meaning it can be a pain in the balls to hit fast flying targets. With its very high battery rating of 5.3 the lack of muzzle velocity does make it rather hard to knock out the typically faster firing planes around these battle ratings. And it's a real shame as the Skink is the last SPAA available to us until we get the Falcon at battle rating 8.0. And arguably the Bosvark which we covered in the last rank is a much better anti-aircraft vehicle with its faster firing, higher muzzle velocity 23mm cannons. South Africa also gives us a few more decent vehicles in rank 4, some of them excellent some of them absolute dog shit. The first, which is more of the latter, is the Rattle 90. This is a 6x6 school bus with a low pressure 90mm cannon. This vehicle provides the Brits with a slightly different playstyle, as up until now we've been using high pressure cannons with APDS rounds, but the South Africans went with low pressure guns using chemical munitions. This isn't a huge change in playstyle, but it makes long range aiming much harder. The Rattle is definitely a vehicle that I would skip, as you can tell by the size of the tank, it sticks out like a sore cock. And combined with the fact that handling of the Rattel is also pretty poor, leaving the tank feeling incredibly sluggish to drive, it makes for a terrible scout vehicle. These factors combined with the tank's battery rating of 6.3 just make it a slog to try and spade the vehicle. So again, I'd strongly recommend to grind it and then never play it. Folded with the Rattel 90 is the Rattel 20. Whereas the former is armed with a 90mm cannon, the 20 is armed with a 20mm cannon as well as Milan ATGMs. There are a lot of vehicles in War Thunder armed with a similar setup, but none of them come close to being this shit. The other vehicles are generally smaller and rely on stealth to close with the enemy 
and then to engage them and get kills. This isn't really possible with the Rattel 20, as like the 90 is like a bloody school bus. It simply isn't fun to play as there is nowhere to hide. It's large and tall, making it unsuitable for both open country and tight city maps. And you also have to stop in order to fire the main weapon, the Milan ATGM. The only gun you can use on the move is the 20mm, which as you can imagine has no effect really on most tanks at this battle rating. The gun also has very limited elevation, only being able to elevate up to 40 degrees, meaning you can't even use the Rattel 20 as a pseudo anti-aircraft vehicle. The only reason for this tank being 6.7 in my opinion is the Milan ATGMs. Just like the Rattel 90, the 20 for me is a hard pass. Following the trend of weird looking South African vehicles, the G6 takes centre stage. This is a self-propelled gun with a 155mm cannon, similar to the M109A1. While mainly being a meme vehicle, as fire missions aren't exactly possible in War Thunder, the 11 kilos of TNT the G6 sheets out every time you pull the trigger certainly won't be making the enemies laugh. While not at all being practical, the G6 is a lot of fun to play. People see it as an easy kill and mistakenly try and brawl with it, forgetting its high velocity 155 makes sniping HE rounds quite easy. It certainly is no Vidar as it lacks a laser rangefinder, but it's still a lot of fun for an experienced player. And our final wheelie boy, the Elan 90, again another South African vehicle, and it uses the same gun that was found on the Rattel, except it is now mounted on a 4x4 chassis. This solves the issues with the stealth and the mobility found on the Rattels, as the Elan is drastically smaller and faster. It is sometimes too fast though, as you can't slow the bloody thing down and end up looking like an extra from Tokyo Drift. The Eland is a good backup vehicle, it can rush at the start of a match, or be used as a late game Rambo rusher trying to make it to a cap circle before the enemy wins. It isn't amazing at getting kills though, as its gun handling is awful, it just bounces around a lot when you're driving, you can't really shoot on the move, and even when you come to a complete stop, the suspension rocks back and forth like it's having a disco or something. It's really really hard to get shots off on this thing. It's best to use your speed at the start of a match, get to a strong choke point, hold it and wait for the enemies to come to you, rather than actively seeking out enemy players. While it does have major flaws, the Elan 90 deals with the major weaknesses of the Rattle, and I generally do bring it along in my 7.7 .7 lineup and use it as a fast scouting vehicle. Finally for rank 4, let's cover the premiums, of which I believe there are only really two to choose from. The first, and by far the worst, is the Black Prince. No, not Prince Harry's son, it's the final evolution of the Churchill. It's now even more overweight and even more outclassed at its battery rating of 6.0. It features the long barreled 17 pounder as well as the APGS ammunition, which certainly can hit hard, but like all of the other Churchills, it has mediocre armour at best and no mobility to speak of. This tank sets War Thunder streets on fire boys with its blistering top speed of 19 kilometers per hour. That's right, 19 kilometers per hour going forwards. As I said, totally outclassed. The gun is nothing special either at this battle rating, and with the sorry state of your mobility and survivability, your enemies, which are mainly going to be King Tigers and IS-2 1944s, aren't going to struggle to ethically dispatch you, which probably is the most humane thing for them to do to you, sending you back to the hangar before Black Prince induced psychosis can set in. The better purchase in my opinion is a Centurion Action X or Action 10, this is basically a Centurion Mark III with a different turret, shaped more like the turret found on the FB4202. This turret design doesn't feature a gun mantlet, which in real life gave the turret more structural strength, but in War Thunder it doesn't really do much. But to be honest lads, there isn't really a great standout premium in rank 4, they're all kind of mid. The Action X is a much better pick in my opinion, but it still isn't a fantastic grinder. And that's a wrap for rank 4 boys, as I alluded to in the Centurion part at the beginning, Rank 4 of the British Tech Tree is one of the sick men of War Thunder. It used to be fantastic, but Gaijin have nerfed APDS dramatically and increased the battle ratings of the main British tanks to the point of obscenity. Why the Centurions are a full battle rating higher than the King Tigers I will never know. While Rank 4 is very mediocre, there is an emerging 6.3 lineup, but it is just full of mediocre vehicles. Apart from 6.3, we also have the 7.7 .7 lineup mainly comprising of Centurions, as well as a few tanks for our next chapter, Rank 5. We now move on to Rank 5, surprisingly one of the smaller ranks in the entire tree. We're mainly going to be looking at vehicles from the early Cold War, 
and we see the shift away from the 20 pounder towards the 105mm L7 cannon, a staple of many tanks in many nations all across War Thunder. While the L7 cannon was used on many a famous tank, including the M1 Abrams, at these lower battle ratings, we are still using the early APDS and Hesh ammunition. So we don't yet have the ammunition which made the L7 legendary. A rather strange tank to start us off is the Carnarvon, one of the two heavies in rank 5. This tank would go on to be developed into the Conqueror, which we'll cover next. Surprisingly, this heavy tank has a better mobility than all of the previous Centurions, due to its monster 750 horsepower engine. The armor is also very good, the hull has a well-sloped armor plate, and the Centurion Mark III turret is surprisingly bouncy. The problem, like the rest of the earlier Centurions, is the gun. The tank is still using the 20 pounder gun, so the APDS is a bit worse for wear. It's made even worse in this tank, as it plays like a heavy, but you don't have that knockout punch of a traditional heavy tank gun. A King Tiger only needs one round to penetrate to get a kill, whereas this tank usually requires several. So while it's a fun tank to play and gives you some well needed mobility, it isn't exactly meta. It's also Welsh, so keep it away from livestock. Next we have the absolute giga chad that is the Conqueror. It was designated the FV215 and uses the same gun that we saw on the Conway. The 120mm L1A2. Unlike that tank which had no armour, the Conqueror is positively blessed in the armour department. The upper frontal plate is basically immune to everything other than missiles or AP FSDS, both of which you very rarely encounter at 7.7. .7. The turret is also shaped in a way which makes it bounce most incoming rounds, and the gun mantlet is so thick that the rounds can't really do anything to get through it. There are gaps in the armour though, like the tortoise from earlier, the Conqueror has a large commander's cupola, which is the obvious frontal weak spot of this vehicle. Like the Tortoise's machine gun turrets, an enemy APHE round will be able to splash your crew here, usually killing the tank in a single hit. But you yourself, of course, have a huge upper cutting machine between your legs. The L1A2 hits like Tyson in his prime, and with the larger APGS, it generally has very consistent damage. Just remember to aim for ammunition and crew members, rather than centre of mass. I personally have been inside a Conqueror when I visited the tank museum and it is personally one of my favourite tanks. While the long reload speed does leave it a little out of the meta, especially in an up tier, but the tank is certainly one of the best heavy tanks in the game and a personal highlight of the British tech tree. A vehicle that is certainly no longer a highlight is the Centurion Mark X. This retains the rather poor mobility of the original Centurion tank but has had a 50mm plate welded onto the front, giving you slightly more protection at the cost of an additional ton of weight. We also have the aforementioned 105mm cannon, which strangely performs much better than 20 pounder found on the previous version of tanks. Like the Conqueror's gun, the higher calibre 105mm APDS performs a lot better than the 77mm 20 pounder's gun. The APDS can penetrate 350mm at point blank range, which isn't bad at all for an 8.0 vehicle. The gun stable is also very nice, especially considering we're at the same battle rating as the German Leopard 1 and the Soviet T-54s, which both lack a gun stabilizer. The biggest weakness though, again, it is the heavy tank level of mobility. It's slow at the expense of its armor, at a battle rating where there is no real armor meta. The up tiers are also incredibly punishing, getting your cheeks clapped by missiles and object 279 mains is a right kick in the urethra. Also in rank 5, we have a tank designed for export. Like most of the British companies in the mid Cold War, they were slightly struggling to stay afloat. And when I say slightly, I mean they were on the verge of bankruptcy. The first tank is the Vickers Mark 1. This is basically a cheaper version of the Centurion Mark 10. It uses the same 105mm gun, giving it excellent firepower, but it has no armor to speak of. The upside is the enhanced mobility compared to the Centurion Mark 10 which makes this in my opinion the better of the two tanks. You should play the Vickers Mark 1 like a stabilized Leopard. It has the same great firepower as a Leopard and most of the mobility. In my opinion the Vickers is by far the better of the two 8.0 tanks in the British tech tree and is my first born at this battle rating. A surprisingly good vehicle, if not a little limited by playstyle, is the Swingfire. The vehicle, named after the missile, can carry 14 missiles with two in the ready rack. These weapons will loft when launched, meaning they are fired upwards at about a 45 degree angle and then drop down towards your point of aim. This means that you can't really engage enemies at close range. They are still very effective in my opinion. 
After the missile aerodynamic changes in the last update, many ATGMs are kinda shitty to use now, but the swing fires are still very responsive and deal a good amount of damage. The sight of the tank is also mounted very high up. This, in combination with the missiles lofting, allows you to stay hull down and fire the missiles at enemy players who can't really do anything in return to you. For 8.0, it is a very underappreciated little troll tank, get hull down and start causing players to mold in all chat. And finally for the tech tree, we have the destroyer of worlds, the Falcon. If you've encountered this beast in the wild, then you'll know its status of an anti-aircraft vehicle is a lie. This is an anti-everything vehicle. It's armed with two 30mm cannons, which can fire APGS rounds, as well as a selection of high explosive and API rounds. This tank shreds planes and tanks alike. The reason for its power is the very high muzzle velocity of its guns, giving it fantastic penetration against enemy tanks and allowing you to easily lead incoming planes. While not as powerful as it used to be after many, many increases in battle rating, it is still a monster backup vehicle at 8.0 and fits well into the emerging 8.3 and 8.7 British lineups. Moving on to the premiums, and we start with the Vickers Mark V slash 1. This is an Aussie tank, but unfortunately, it doesn't come with any VB long neck. This can only be purchased on the Gaijin Marketplace, as it was a reward for a previous event. To put it simply, the 5 slash 1 is a Centurion Mark 10 hull with a Centurion Mark 3 turret. We have the upgraded 50mm hull armor add on to the upper frontal plate, but we lose the 105mm gun found on the Mark 10, still using the Centurion Mark 3's turret with its rather decent, but not amazing, 84mm 20 pounder gun. While basically just another Centurion, this is rank 5, allowing us to grind out battle rating 10.0 vehicles while playing a 7.7 .7 medium tank. It's currently selling for around $70 on the Gaijin Marketplace, and for that price, it certainly isn't worth it. But if you can get it for cheap, or they bring it back in a sale or an event, it's a nice little premium. And for our final rank 5 premium, we have the Avery, our Armoured Vehicle Royal Engineers. It's a specialist demolition vehicle armed with a 165mm cannon. Like the FV4005, this does not use a kinetic warhead. Instead, like the 183mm, it uses a monster Hesch round, allowing you to serve high explosive pancakes to all the lovely German mains. Compared to the 183mm though, the 165 on the Avery has a lot lower muzzle velocity and does a lot less damage but we can still penetrate over 8 inches of armour at all ranges and angles, but generally this tank struggles against most of the Soviet and German tanks popular at the battle rating. As a premium, it isn't a great grinder, its reload is very long and the poor gun characteristics makes it aiming hard for newer players. It's rather sad because there isn't really a great standout premium for rank 5, kind of the same as rank 4. Instead, I'd recommend people put a talisman on the Conqueror, it's battle rating 7.7 .7, and it can be used with the Centurions from rank 4, giving you a decent lineup at 7.7. .7. Well that's it boys, short and sweet as I said. Rank 5 has some very nice vehicles. We start to see the blend between the old and the modern. We saw the last of the World War 2 influenced vehicles with the Carnarvon and the Conqueror and we ended with the late 60s era swing fire. Rank 5, apart from the two 7.7 .7 heavies, is largely forgettable though in my opinion kind of like all of British history from the 60s onwards. It's just a mediocre vehicle from companies that were on the verge of bankruptcy. Rank 5 in my opinion is pretty bland, but the next rank, rank 6, is where we start to see some flair from the British, as well as the majority of the South African vehicles. We now move on to the largest rank in the British tech tree, the dreaded rank 6. Many of the vehicles here are currently frontline units of the South African Armed Forces, and we also have a contingent of British vehicles of 1980s vintage. While rank 5 was defined by vehicles using APDS, in rank 6 we finally get some APFSDS, in many ways solving the damage consistency that has been present on most of the British guns so far. We also get access to some light tanks, solving the other major issue with the British tech tree, the dire lack of mobility. I'm going to start with the South African vehicles, which bring quite a lot to rank 6, both in terms of the number of vehicles, as well as additional playstyles. Our first vehicle, coming in at battery rating 8.3, is the Aruakat Mark 1D. This long distance sprinter is fitted with a 76mm naval gun that comes equipped with a sable round. 
Now, if you're experienced with the small caliber AP FSDS in game, you know that it ha basically has the post pen damage of a spud gun. This is a common issue for all of the smaller caliber tank guns in War Thunder. Most notably, the biggest issue with it is on the HSTVL, which has terrible post pen damage. But the Sable round on the Ruid Cat can still penetrate over 300 millimeters of armor, which, if we're being fair, is very capable at the battle rating of 8.3, especially due to the recent battle rating changes, which now means 8.3 sees a lot of down tiers. The vehicle is also very mobile on hard terrain, allowing you to flank an enemy easily, or like the Elan 90, Rambo rush a cap at the start or end of a match. In my humble opinion, the Ruid Cats on the Ruid Cat Mark 1D is a big W for the British tech tree. The complete opposite of the Ruicat is the Oliphant Mark 1A. This is a Centurion Mark III that has undergone several modernizations. It has similar performance of a Centurion Mark 10. It's big and slow with a 105mm con. It is worth pointing out though that unlike the Mark 10, the Oliphant does not get the additional armor on the upper frontal plate, but what we do get is a substantially upgraded engine. Going from 650 horsepower of the Mark 10 to 750 horsepower in the Oliphant. Also new is the GT3 Cannon, and we even have a new round, the M111, a South African equivalent of DM23, with over 330 millimeters of penetration. The round has good consistent damage and penetration, and can't really be faulted, but the Oliphant isn't particularly a good vehicle. It's a Centurion that's been modernized with a slightly better engine and gun. While the 100 extra horsepower is nice, the tank is still incredibly sluggish to play and is nowhere near compared to other vehicles around the same battle rating. You still have that time old British tradition of being a medium tank that feels and plays like a heavy. Another variant of the Ruid Cat we have in game is the MTTD, an auto loading prototype. This gives you a solid constant reload speed of 6.7 seconds, which isn't affected if your loader gets knocked out. The MTTD also ditches the 76mm, replacing it with the GT7 cannon, which is a 105mm gun. In fact, it's basically the same gun found on the Elephant, except with a new gun breach. Just like the Elephant as well, the MTTD also uses DM23 for its main anti-tank round, but this vehicle has seen its battle rating increased up to 9.0. This means you're going to get dragged up to the 10.0 lineup pretty frequently, because of this, I don't really recommend playing at 9.0 in this thing. I've said several times that the British do pretty well at 8.3 and 8.7. I don't think it's worth up to into 9.0 for this tank. And for the last Centurion we'll be looking at today, thank God, is the Oliphant Mark II. As you can probably guess, this is just another modernization. And I use that term very lightly. Well, we're to begin with this monstrosity. It has received a new armor scheme having a large composite box bolted around the turret. This gives you some protection from chemical warheads, but it's kind of useless against the typically fired Sabre round. It also gets bumped up in battle rating to 9.3, which is first in my opinion. That's because this tank gets access to DM-63, a very modern fin round, capable of penetrating over 430 millimeters of armor. This newly acquired firepower, as well as the addition of thermal imaging, does make you a very large threat in a 9.3 match. The engine also saw another upgrade. We now have a 1050 horsepower engine, which does solve some of the mobility issues with the Centurion, but the mobility is still a bit wanting. The Elephant Mark II though certainly does make the Centurion a whole lot more bearable to play, and it is probably the best Centurion model in the game. Anyway boys, let's take a look at some of our SBAAs. Someone took a Ruica and said, you know what that 8x8 needs? two large 35mm cannons and a whopping great radar slapped on the roof. And as you can see, the result was this thing, essentially just a wheeled guepard. In fact, the ZA35 doesn't really distinguish itself in the competition in terms of its air to air performance, but as you can fold down the radar and go into stealth mode, you can drift around the map pumping your 35mm AP rounds into the side of main battle tanks. You are very vulnerable to return fire, granted, but the possibilities and fun to be had is endless. Where the ZA-35 is a bad vehicle made good by creativity, our next vehicle, the ZT-3A2, is just a bad vehicle, with no possibility of redemption. Once again, it uses the same chassis of the Rattel, except it doesn't use a 90mm or a 20mm with an ATGM. Instead, it just has a triple-barreled anti-tank guided missile. We can take two types of missile into a match, 
the stock missile uses a single warhead and the second missile uses a tandem warhead. Both of these missiles have good penetration, but the thing that really limits this vehicle is the missile guidance system. It's absolutely awful. After the new ATGM handling changes, there is huge input lag, meaning they are very hard to steer mid-flight, which obviously for a vehicle with no other forms of armament, that is a huge downside. While it does have a fairly low battery rating of 8.3, the vehicle, once again like the Rattel 90 and the Rattel 20, is simply too large to be used as a stealthy ATGM launcher. It isn't like you can hide this thing and surprise enemies. It was designed to be used in the African savannah, not the cramped modern maps of War Thunder. Just like the MTTD, I generally stay clear of this tank. And the fact that this vehicle is now folded, it means you literally don't need to grind this to progress through the tech tree. So I'd recommend you guys all skip it. Another vehicle which has seen better days, and it breaks my heart to say this, is the Warrior. This old girl has been in War Thunder and the British Army for a very long time. And just like in real life, the tank desperately needs replacing. While the British Army has blowed a load of taxpayer money developing the Ajax, which literally shakes the crew to death inside, there is as of yet no replacement for the Warrior in War Thunder. This is a huge downside for the top tier British lineup, as the Warrior is battery rating 8.3, and we don't have any other scout vehicles in the British tech tree. The reason for the Warrior being so bad is based on quite a few things, to be honest. Firstly, it uses clips for its main cannon, instead of a belt-fed system. This means the fire rate is very poor, firing roughly once every second. While a slower fire rate would usually indicate the gun being more powerful, at least by gamer logic, well, that's not the case. The 30mm of the Warrior is nothing special, and is widely considered unreliable in-game. And to make things worse, the cannon is also unstabilised, at a battery rating where even all the Soviet tanks have a stabiliser. This means that your gun performance, which bear in mind is already pretty awful, is made even worse as you can no longer accurately fire on the move. I'm not really sure what the British Army wanted when they approved this thing for service, but we do also have the Milan ATGM, which is almost certainly going to be your primary weapon while using this tank. The missiles track very well, being one of the more manoeuvrable types. They also have good penetration for an 8.0 vehicle, capable of punching through over 700mm of armour. We also have thermal imaging, and of course, unlike the ZT3A2, we are quite small and stealthy. I generally still do run this thing at top tier as a scout vehicle, where its performance granted isn't very amazing. But at battery rating 8.3, it is a very capable little scout tank. Just make sure you don't try to take on a peer IFE like a BMP2 or a Bradley, as they will tear you a new hole. Other than the ZA35, we also have one other SBAAG. This is the Chieftain Marksman, essentially the same two guns found on the Gepard and the ZA, just in a slightly different turret. This uses the Chieftain Hole, which I guess gives you some sort of protection, but most people are just going to shoot you in the turret, which contains the explosive ammunition, and the bags of meat we call crew members. The chassis of the Chieftain is also very slow, making this tank drastically less enjoyable to play compared to the ZA-35. Despite being the same battle rating and using the same weapon system, the Chieftain Maximum is noticeably less competent in pretty much any playstyle compared to the ZA-35. It's a shame really that the Maximum is the main tech tree vehicle and the ZA-35 is flooded in with it. As after you grind out the ZA-35, in my opinion, there is literally no reason to use the Marksman ever again. Moving away from the South African vehicles and into back to the British vehicles, and we have another export tank made by Vickers. This is the Mark III, and it's just a slight modernization of the Mark I, which we covered in Rank 5. We now have a new turret design with marginally better armor protection, as well as the addition of heat FS, as well as a laser rangefinder giving you a slight bump in firepower and gun handling. For some reason, we also use a less powerful APGS round, giving you substantially less penetration compared to the Mark 1's gun. But we do have an additional heat FS round, which in combination with that laser rangefinder, makes you an absolute monster in the long range sniping role. It's a hell of a lot of additional performance for the slight bump in battery rating up to 8.3, which again can be used in the 8.3 to 8.7 lineup to very good effect. These tanks were bought by Kuwait and sold on license to India, who produced them domestically as the Vijayanta, a premium tank in War Thunder, which we'll discuss later in the video. Another export tank is the Vickers Mark 11, and lads, this one really is a mixed bag. As you can see, it's a bit of a Franken tank. It is a very large hull, 
with a light tank turret mounted on top like a fancy hat. The turret houses a 105mm cannon which fires the M735 Sable rounds. These rounds are pretty mid as the kids say these days, providing decent penetration but minimal splintering damage. The armour of the 6x6 chassis is also paper thin, leaving you incredibly vulnerable to literally anything other than rifle caliber machine guns. The tank does add some much needed mobility to the British 8.7 lineup, but it is an incredibly flawed vehicle. The tank, in my opinion, is just too tall to carry out its designated battlefield role. You can't really be a rat or a camper with a massive hull, really. It's a decent addition to the British tech tree, but it certainly isn't going to be a firstborn, and there are much better vehicles in the 8.7 lineup. Vickers did solve these issues though, and they actually made a decent scout vehicle. This comes directly after the Mark 11, and it is the VFM 5, or the Vickers Mark 5. This vehicle was based on the CCVL from the American tech tree, except with the same turrets found on the Vickers Mark 11. While the CCVL in the American tech tree is currently battery rating 10.0, the VFM 5 is 9.3. So, what are we lacking? Well, it certainly isn't firepower, as we have access to DM33, a very powerful AP FSDS round. Unlike the CCVL though, we do lack a thermal imager. In my opinion, the VFM5 is a side grade to the American CCVL, but it is pretty much a direct upgrade compared to the Vickers Mark 11. It uses the same turret in a dramatically smaller hull, and we even get a better main gun round. It's just a pity that this is battery rating 9.3, as it's just a bit of a rough spot in the current meta, as you're basically getting your shit kicked in by the 10.0 Soviet lineup every game. But enough doom and gloom, let's cover a surprisingly good tank. In rank 5, I'll cover the Swingfire. And in the 80s, the British produced a modernised variant. This used the FV107 chassis and was called the Striker. It has an increased first stage missile stowage, going from 2 missiles on the Swingfire to 5 on the Striker. It uses the same guidance system as the Swingfire, but now comes equipped with thermal imaging, as well as the Mark II missile going from 535mm of penetration of the Mark I Swingfire to 700mm on the Mark II. Due to the lofting system, these tanks are great to hold down, as you only need the guidance camera to be exposed in order to guide the missile. However, on the Striker, the guidance camera is mounted a lot lower down compared to the camera on the Swingfire. So the earlier vehicle is much better hold down in my opinion, but the Striker has much better mobility, more advanced missiles and thermal imaging. Well boys, the time has come to subject ourselves to the true pain and misery as we take a look at the Chieftains. Certainly, these are the sexiest tanks to ever be produced, but that is really where the positives end. These tanks are pretty old, designed when the T-55 and the T-62 were still being fielded by the Soviets, in their non-modernised variants. The Chieftain was designed to give fantastic protection against gun firing traditional APC-BC and APDS rounds not the powerful AP FSDS rounds which are now being fired back at you on the battlefield. Historically, the T-64 really was a kick in the balls for the British, as we went from having very well armed and armoured tanks, to looking rather average in both departments compared to the new Soviet main battle tank. The Chieftain, unlike American, German and French designs, focused on thick armour over mobility. Well, is it helpful to have thick armour on the approaches to top tier? Well, yes and no. It does keep you safe from the infantry fighting veal cannons, but gives you next to no protection against most of the tank guns that will be firing at you. It's also fitted with a weak engine, which being British designed, meant it didn't fucking work. Granted, this was mainly due to the retarded policy of NATO multi-fuel engines, but the Americans and Germans managed, and the British were once again plagued by terrible mobility. We've now come full circle from rank 2 and 3. Free cheers for British engineers. Where many people will say the Chieftain is strong though, is its main gun. While most other NATO countries were using the excellent 105mm L7, the British decided to go with a 120mm, and somehow the main APDS of the 120 has 50mm less penetration than the 105. Granted, it does have better angled penetration, but in general, APDS rounds at battery rating 8.7 are considered pretty much outclassed. While the penetration of the APDS round is nowhere near terrible, it isn't really needed anymore at this battle rating, with most other vehicles in the Cold War going with dramatically less armour compared to World War II vehicles, there aren't many tanks that you're going to be fighting which are going to struggle to penetrate. The issue with the Chieftains, just like the issues with the early Centurions, is post-pen damage. 
a lot of lightweight armoured tanks around battle rating 8.7, they don't really have enough armour plate to create shrapnel. Because of this, the APDS rounds again have a major issue causing post pen damage. Because of this, I'd always recommend to aim for the crew members. This is good practice for any tank in War Thunder, but it's near a necessity for the chieftains. The rate of fire is also lower than contemporary 105mm guns, due to the larger caliper and two-piece ammunition. While AP FSDS would be nice, the APDS can still be used at 8.7. While I do have major gripes with the main gun, by far the main issue with the Chieftain is the mobility. It has a power to weight ratio of 12.1, which is basically the same as the Centurion Mark III at 7.7. .7. Overall though, for some strange reason, the Chieftain Mark III is doing surprisingly well in the current meta. It's seemingly getting many down tiers, which dramatically increases its performance. But I'd recommend you guys playing this tank fast while the fun lasts, because Gaijin's going to do what they always do, and they'll increase the battle rating of tanks which people find fun to play. No boys, you aren't allowed to have fun in War Thunder. That would cut down on Golden Eagle sales. Anyway, we also have the Chieftain Mark V. This also sits at battle rating 8.7, and this was the final variant to be produced on mass scale. Not really much has changed from the Mark III, but we do get an engine upgrade, going from 660 horsepower of the Mark III to 760 horsepower of the Mark V. This increases the power to weight ratio from 12.1 to 13.8, but that is the only major change between the 3 and the 5. We have the same gun and armour, just marginally better mobility. The Mark V is folded with the Mark III, but I would actually recommend that you grind this one. It doesn't take that long, now that folded vehicles have had their RP reduced, and again it is a great tank in the current 8.7 meta. A chieftain that isn't doing too great in the current meta is the Mark X. This was the true modernisation of this tank, and probably the variant that most people think of when they hear the name Chieftain. It features the legendary Stillbrew armour add-on, which sits on top of the turret, giving you additional protection from chemical warheads. The engine performance remains unchanged from the Mark V, but we do also have the extra weight from the add-on armour, as well as a laser rangefinder. The major addition though, is the 120mm AP FSDS round, the L23. It has high penetration, but just like the APDS, the post pen damage is a rather lacklustre. Overall though, in terms of sheer performance, this is the best Chieftain in the tech tree, but the reason I wouldn't recommend people playing it is because of its battle rating of 9.0. It's outside that 8.7 golden lineup, and I don't think the addition of L23 or the Stillbrew add-on armour is worth the potential risk of an up tier to 10.0. And that's it boys for tech tree vehicles. Rank 6 used to be bigger, but Gaijin moved the challengers up to rank 7 for some reason. All that we've got left to cover now are the premiums, and unlike rank 5, we actually have quite a lot of decent grinders. Being aggressive in the early stage of a game is my go-to strategy with the British, and the vehicle I do this in is the Ruicat 105, the first of the three premiums we'll be covering. This tank is straight up probably the best performing premium the British have access to. It doesn't have good armour, but what it does have is speed and firepower. Like the Ruicat Mark 1D, the 105 is an 8x8 wheeled vehicle, but as you've probably guessed, it's equipped with a 105mm cannon, similar to the gun found on the MTTD, except the 105 does not have an autoloader. Another difference is while the MTTD gets DM23, the 105 gets DM33, giving it both better penetration and post pen damage, making the premium Ruicat by far the best Ruicat variant in the game. The only catch of course, is that it's behind a $60 paywall. Thanks Gaijin. The battle rating of 9.3 does also push it out of the 8.7 lineup, obviously, but this tank can perform at any battle rating. DM33 is no joke, and I still bring this tank to top tier alongside my Challenger 2s. As I said, it has a lot of potential. Despite the cost, in my opinion this tank has the highest skill ceiling of the rank 6 premiums. It can have the most substantial effect on the outcome of a battle, but you have to be a genuinely skilled player to make it work. Map knowledge and game sense are vital for survival, as well as making this an effective grinder. If you're an experienced player of War Thunder, then this premium is for you. If you're wondering how to tell if you're an experienced War Thunder player or not, well, if you still look forward to playing when you get home every day, and are still capable of positive emotions, you probably aren't a long time War Thunder player. Our next premium is the Indian Vajayanta, or however you pronounce it, I can't speak Indian, and I don't really care anyway. 
I spoke about this tank earlier. It's basically a premium Vickers Mark 1 with an engine camouflage. I personally haven't purchased this vehicle and I'm not going to spend 50 quid for this video, which I'm not even going to make back in ad revenue. So you're going to have to make do with footage of Vickers Mark 1. Sorry, boys. And the biggest reason for this is that it's pretty much a complete downgrade compared to even the Vickers Mark 1. The Tech Tree Vickers sits at battery rating 8.0 and has an engine producing 608 horsepower. For some reason, the premium Vijayanta sits at battery rating 8.3, with an engine only producing 538 horsepower. So it has less engine power and a higher battery rating, despite having the exact same armor and firepower. A much better option is simply just putting a talisman on the Vickers Mark III, as it has that fantastic heat of S round, laser rangefinder, better mobility, and of course, it's a lot cheaper to just get a talisman. And finally for rank 6, we have the Khalid. You may pass for free. You are a friend of Al Khalid. Anyway, this is a modernized Chieftain Mark V, sold to the Jordanian Armed Forces. Unlike other modernizations in War Thunder, which usually adds things like more modern rounds and thermal imaging, but with the Khalid, we just get a new engine. Arguably though, this fixes a lot of issues with the original Chieftains. The Khalid is fitted with a 1200 horsepower engine compared to the 760 horsepower engine fitted to the Tetri Mark V. So you do have a fantastic level of flexibility with the Khalid. It also gets the L23 fin round from the Mark X, but it doesn't get the Mark X's add-on armor, which brings us onto the largest weakness of the Khalid, which is the survivability. The tank was obviously designed in the 60s to fight APC BC rounds, and you are now frequently seeing up to 10.3 fighting Leopard 2s and M1 KVTs. Fighting these tanks armed with high power Sable rounds isn't particularly fun, and your armor is essentially just dead weight. Unlike the other two premium vehicles I covered, the Khalid is a Golden Eagle Premium, meaning this tank doesn't come with any additional premium time or extra Golden Eagles. Personally, I didn't really like the Khalid when it was first added to the game, but I think this was me playing it wrong. Now, I kind of actually like it, I do well by using my good mobility at the start of a match, getting into a strong hold down position, and then basically just playing very defensively. I run a 9.3 lineup with the Ruricat 105, VFM5, and the Khalid. It does make a nice little power lineup, it's just the up tiers which are a problem. And also, just like the Ruricat 105, the strongest chieftain in the game is also behind a paywall. And that's rank 6, lads. Quite an eclectic group of vehicles, as I'm sure you'll agree. Most of the tanks in this rank go well with the vehicles from rank 5. The 8.3 Vickers Mark 1 is still useful at 8.7 with the Chieftains, and we finally got some light tanks to help us on the wide open maps. I generally recommend players to stick at 8.7 rather than go up to 9.3. It avoids the painful up tiers, and the British 8.7 is very underrated in the current meta. From here on inwards, lads, we have the modern big boys of the British Tech Tree. Most of the tanks in the next rank are very samey and offer no real variety of playstyle or capabilities. Alright boys, last rank until the suffering ends, both for you watching and me recording this video. This is 30 pages long in the script and my voice is absolutely gone. I feel like I've smoked 50 cigarettes in an hour. My throat is absolutely gone. Anyway, this is rank 7. It's very small, mainly due to the British arms industry being on its ass. Most of the tanks here are minor upgrades compared to one another. For a military, they would be considered the same tank, but Guardian has took some creative liberty and created several variants with slight changes just to buff out the British tech tree. Rank 7 is currently home to 9 main battle tanks and 2 air defense vehicles, an event vehicle and 1 premium. Luckily, most of the main battle tanks have now been folded, allowing them to be grinded out at a reduced RP cost. Let's start with the meat and potatoes, the main battle tanks. Up first, we have the Challengers. These have quite a rough history, both in game and in real life. They started life as an upgraded variant of the Chieftain, designed on behalf of the Iranian army, and was never intended for service by the British. But after the collapse of the MBT-80 program in Britain, and more importantly the collapse of the Shah in Iran, the British government took the design of the then Shia one, now Challenger one, and adapted it for combat in Western Europe. It featured all the juicy technology that had been developed since the Chieftains, introducing the semi-new Chobham non-explosive reactive armour, 
giving it fantastic protection against private conscriptovich firing RPGs. In game though, the Challenger does offer you fantastic protection against all chemical based warheads, with the exception of some of the high power Soviet ATGMs, such as the Carnet found on the BMP 2M. It also performs rather well against kinetic projectiles. For example, the Soviet Premium T 72 Terms, well known for using an above average dart round at 10.0, is unable to penetrate the turret sheets of this vehicle with its 3BM 42 Mango round. So while the tanks do have good levels of protection, what we certainly do not have, again, that time-old British tradition, is mobility. It seems even in the modern era, us British still can't make good tank engines. The Challenger 1s, along with their bigger brothers, the Challenger 2s, are well known for being incredibly lacking in speed and acceleration. While most NATO tanks are using engines producing around 1500 horsepower, the British can only manage around 1200. This lower engine power, combined with British tanks also generally being much heavier than other Western tanks, is the reason for such poor mobility. And this trend is going to be present in all but one of the following main battle tanks. We then come on to the gun, and it's the same gun that we found on the Chieftains back at Battle Rating 8.3. Our stock round is the same Sabre that's found on the Mark 10, the L23. It compares pretty well to the Soviet 3BM22 round, found down at battle rating 9.0. While it performs decently enough in 10.0 games, it's certainly very lacking in an up tier. Luckily we do also have L23A1, an upgraded round with less flat penetration, but 30mm battled angled penetration, making it much more reliable at penetrating the sloped upper frontal plates of Soviet main battle tanks. But just like the L23, in an up tier the L23A1 is a little bit of a struggle and generally performs very poorly compared against 3BM42, the standard meta round at 10.0. Like most other tanks around this battle rating, the Challenger ones have a laser rangefinder, as well as first generation thermal imaging for the gunner's sight. Overall though, while there is sort of an armor meta with the Challengers, unfortunately, again, being passive in War Thunder just isn't that valuable, especially at top tier with the high action and fast paced gameplay. It means you're either camping in a defensive position, which is unlikely considering the slow speed of this vehicle, or you're sitting towards the rear of the map, which usually isn't helping your team take capture points. The tank is also highly map dependent in my opinion. Its ability to do well is heavily dependent on the type of map. If it's a wide open area with lots of hills and long sight path, then it's excellent for this vehicle. Tight city maps on the other hand, it's not even really worth spawning the Challengers. We do have an upgraded variant, the Challenger Mark III. This again is a basic copy and paste with a few minor changes. We get access to the fantastic L26 fin round, which is very powerful with over 471mm of armor penetration, which in my opinion does equal the Soviet Mango round. It's just a shame that the Challenger Mark II also doesn't get the L26, as that would have made a fantastic purring. The Mark III also gets the Ramor add-on armor kit, giving you better protection from chemical rounds on the lower frontal plate, as well as the side skirts. You also get a bit more armor protection around the ammunition. Not exactly exciting changes are they, but again, this is British engineering from the early 80s. But ladies and gentlemen, a rare miracle was performed. A British company, again Vickers, produced a tank which was fantastic, and yet it never entered service. This was the Vickers Mark 7, and it solved pretty much all of the issues with the Challenger series of main battle tanks. This was the Vickers Mark 7, this tank uses the hull of the Leopard 2A4 with a ugly turret on top, housing the same 120mm British gun. The Leopard 2A4 hull, made by Kraft Maasai, gave the Vickers Mark 7 an excellent level of both protection and mobility, and the turret equaled that of the Challenger 1, having a thermal imager, gun stabiliser, and the same great long range performance of the gun on the Challenger 1. The Vickers Mark 7 also gets access to the fantastic L26 APF SDS round, giving you a big bump in firepower at battle rating 10.3. The Vickers Mark 7 and the Chieftain Mark 3 are by far the best tanks, or uh, best Tech Tree tanks for the British 10.3 lineup, with the Vickers Mark 7 giving you the enhanced mobility, and the Chieftain Mark 3 giving you a long range sniping, more armor meta tank. Another strange looking tank is the TTD. This stands for the Tank Technology Demonstrator. Due to the South Africans being under arms embargo for some pretty spicy things they were doing in that country, they couldn't exactly ask nicely for some Leopard 2s. 
So they decided to make the Roan. I'm obviously being facetious, but the tank they produced does bear a remarkable resemblance to the Leopard 2A4. The TTD was the best the South Africans could produce domestically, and what we have in War Thunder is a pretty nice battle rating 10.0 tank. We have a power to weight ratio just above 21 horsepower per tonne when fully upgraded, giving it decent, but not exceptional mobility, but it is far better than the Challenger Mark II, which serves its same battle rating. The firepower is also better. While it still only has a 105mm gun, just like the Oliphant Mark II, it gets access to the fantastic DM63 round, giving it 430mm of penetration. While it doesn't have a Quetzal machine gun, which is a bit of a quirk for a tank, we do have very good gun handling, with a stabiliser, as well as second generation thermal imaging for the gunner's sight. This thermal imager itself is a big advantage over both the Challenger and the Vickers Mark 7, which only have first generation thermals. One downside though is the reload speed. The TTD with an ace crew can reload every 6.7 seconds, compared to the 6 seconds of the Vickers and the 5 seconds of the Challengers. Despite having to grind out the entire South African line to get the TTD, I'd say it's well worth it. It sits between the Vickers and Challengers in terms of mobility and armour protection, and compares very well to both of them in terms of firepower. Let's take a quick break from the main battle tanks and cover our two air defence vehicles, before we finish with the Challenger 2s. We'll start with the Stormer. This is a fairly unique air defence vehicle. Instead of using radar, it uses an IRST, or infrared search and track, a passive system for detecting aircraft. This means enemies will not be alerted when you lock onto them, but it also doesn't give you any range data. The Stormer fires the Stormer High Velocity Missile. This consists of a single stage rocket motor with three darts mounted on top. When launched, the missile motor burns and accelerates the darts up to a very high speed, 1178 meters per second to be precise. After the motor burns out, the darts separate and travel to the target using a laser targeting system. These missiles have serious strengths and serious weaknesses. During the initial motor burn, the missiles are incredibly sluggish, not wanting to manoeuvre due to the huge amounts of thrust being applied by the rocket. This makes them unsuitable for use against close range targets. Anything with around 1.5km is going to be quite challenging to hit, so we do have a pretty large minimal engagement range. So what about the maximum range? Well here we have another problem. As soon as the three darts separate from the spent motor, they are losing speed and slowing down. Because of this, the Stormer is not capable of being a long range weapon, only really being effective out to a range of 7km. This is an issue due to the modern helicopters found at these battle ratings. American helicopters using the Hellfire have a standoff range of 8km for example, and Soviet helicopters with their Kias can stand off at 10km, meaning that these helicopters can kill you and you can't do shit in return. Regardless of the missile's quirks though, within 1.5 to 7 kilometers, the Stormer is a very lethal anti-aircraft system. The high speed makes it very hard for enemy helicopter players to dodge, as the closing speed is so high. The chassis itself also has third generation thermal imaging and the fantastic IRST feature. The Stormer is very capable in the 10.3 British lineup, you just have to be aware of its flaws and work around them. While the Stormer provides air defense for the 10.3 lineup, the M113 ADATs will provide cover for your 12.0 lineup. Sitting at battery rating 11.7, as you've probably guessed, this vehicle uses the same missile system found on the American ADATs, but instead of using a Bradley hull, this tank uses the M113 APC as its chassis. If you're confused by this, seeing as the British never used the M113, that's because this vehicle is technically a Canadian air defense system. Unlike the American version, we lose the 25mm cannon mounted on top, which does leave the tank feeling very vulnerable on the ground. Just like the Tunguska, the thing that makes the ADAT scurry to deal with is that fast firing auto cannon that can rip through your barrel if you try to rush it. The Brit Bong ADATs can't do that, but we still do have the good old MIM-146 dual purpose missiles, capable of penetrating over 900mm of armour, as well as being used as an anti-aircraft missile. For clarity, these missiles have a proximity fuse warhead for dealing with aircraft, but can also be used against both air and ground targets. The flight characteristics of the missiles are decently good, they travel at just over 1000 meters per second and have a range of 10 kilometers, allowing you to reach out and hit those targets too far to hit with the Stormer. The missiles are also generally feel quite responsive to player input, which makes hitting those long range targets even easier. 
which is more can be said for the old VT-1, the old best missile in the game, before the recent missile guidance changes in the last couple of patches. There are some downsides though in my opinion. Because of the dual purpose missiles, Gaijin classifies this tank as a missile tank destroyer, rather than an SPAA. This means the spawn cost is actually quite high. If you spawn in two MBTs and die without kills in both, you usually won't have enough spawn points to take out the ADATs. I guess this is a skill issue, but I usually take both the ADATs and the Stormer into my top tier lineup, as the Stormer has a lower spawn cost, and is generally available for you to spawn, even if you're having a bad game. Well lads, that's all the other vehicles in rank 7. From here on in, it's all Challenger 2s. The original Challenger 2 was designed in 1986, and was mainly spurred on by the British disappointment with the Challenger 1s, and the age-old British tradition of bullying the Middle East. The Challenger 2 reinforces the strengths of the earlier Challengers, with extremely well-protected turret cheeks, but with improved frontal hull protection and marginally better mobility. However, the tanks do suffer from the same similar weaknesses, a particularly weak lower frontal plate and non-existent side protection. The Challenger 2 has a much larger gun mantle compared to the previous Challenger. This mantle is very weak in comparison to the rest of the turret, providing roughly only 300mm of protection making it an easy lol pen for every top tier tank gun. Even the lower tier 105 guns will be able to punch right through. Another area of the Challenger 2, which is basically the British tank equivalent of the Arden, is the driver's port. That's right, the British engineers thought that cutting a hole in your frontal armour and having no protection behind it was a brilliant strategy to protect the crew. Because of this decision, even the German World War II Panzer IVs can penetrate your driver's port. As I said, British engineering. The turret design is also pretty busted. While most other tanks feature almost flat top roofs, the Challengers is sloped kind of. This means some tanks with high power sable rounds can skip over your turret cheeks and just shoot you in the roof. The high power sable round not caring about the steep impact angle. The armor layout, like the Abrams, is good in theory, but in practice, as I've demonstrated, has huge glowing obvious weak spots. Because of these deficiencies, I'd recommend players never try to brawl in the Challenger 2s. It's no longer the 19th century, and the locals are armed with more than just spears now. Getting up close and personal just won't work in the Challenger 2. Where it does excel though, just like the Challenger 1, is long range hold down sniping. Unfortunately for us, that is quite a niche playstyle in War Thunder, especially in realistic battles, where the maps are now trending towards being more urban tight areas. However, in simulator battles, the Challenger 2 remains competitive and is actually one of the better tanks in simulator battles, mainly due to its high resolution thermal imaging and excellent fire control systems. The Challenger 2 is fitted with the 120mm L30A1 cannon, a more modern variant of the gun found on the Challenger 1. Both of these guns are rifled, a British trait, which arguably provides more accuracy, but that is kind of British cope. Whatever positive the rifling brings, the negative is the lack of ammunition compatibility with other NATO partners. This means Britain cannot just buy DM-53 from the Germans and use that monster round. Instead, the Challenger 2s only have access to L-23A1, L-26 and L-27A1 Sable rounds, as well as the L-31A7 Hesh and the L-34 Smoke Shell. Your main round, the L-27A1, is the best round currently available to the British in real life. It's not like Gaijin can add a more modern super dart in order to buff the British in the future, like they did with the Leopard 2A5s with DM-53. The round itself though, with 560mm of flat pen and 320mm of pen at 60 degrees, certainly isn't weak. Granted, compared to something like DM-53, it's about 50 degrees less capable against sloped armour, but I can't complain really. L-27A1, it'll penetrate all the Soviet tanks as long as you aim for their common weak spots. And with NATO tanks generally having weaker hulls, you can always just shoot them there and be pretty much guaranteed to penetrate. The L-30A1 has a base reload time of 6.5 seconds, improving to 5 seconds with an ace crew, making the Challenger 2 the fastest firing top tier tank, with the exception of the Type 10, which cheats and uses an autoloader. As I've already covered, the high rate of fire would usually allow brawling, but the complete lack of effective armour shuts down this playstyle. Unless you're playing against American mains, aka retards, most competent players will easily know where to shoot you and kill you in a single hit. And considering your gun breach and driver's port is the same size as a small continent, the enemy isn't exactly going to struggle to hit these areas. 
All of the Challenger 2s we're going to be looking at all have second generation thermal images for the gunner sight and some even have a thermal for the commander. Generally speaking the firepower is good for the top tier British, it's just the two other factors of tank design that the British fucked up, survivability and mobility. Speaking of that first fuck up let's cover the mobility. Even the bastard French designers made a tank that was faster than our Challenger and they can also reverse faster. But I'm not going to make a racial French joke as I've already made too many of these in this video and as I'm sure you've seen in recent years, British police now think that telling jokes is illegal. Anyway, the engine was designed by Perkins and creates around 1217 horsepowers when fully upgraded. Again, on most Challenger 2 models, this is noticeably lower than the 1500 horsepower standard produced by Abrams and Leopard equivalents. And compared to both of those two tanks, the mobility of the Challenger 2 is drastically worse. Again, hurting the ability of this tank to brawl or be aggressive at the start of a match. You lag behind pretty much every other top tier tank with the exception of maybe the Macavas. The first Challenger 2 is usually thought of as the weakest of the five in game, but it's also the lightest and has the highest power to weight ratio until you unlock the Challenger 2E. So I use the base Challenger as kind of a sport version, giving me better mobility than the next tanks will look at. And if I'm saying that the base Challenger 2 is sporty compared to the other variants, you can guess I'm going to have some very colourful things to say about them. The Challenger 2 is a fat pig, but the 2F and the TES are overweight Glaswegian pissheads who live off curry and heroin. Anyway, folded with the Challenger 2 is the 2F. This stands for Dorchester Level 2 and pretty much sums up this vehicle. It's a base Challenger 2 with a Dorchester add-on armor package. We get Ramar NERA blocks attached to the lower frontal plate as well as bolted onto the side of the hull and turret. These blocks provide 400mm of protection against chemical warheads but only 30mm against kinetic energy penetrators, the main thing that's going to be fired at you. The add-on armor also adds 6.5 tons of weight to the vehicle, slowing it down substantially and making the downsides of the base model even worse. We then have the Challenger 2 TES, standing for Theatre Entry Standard. In the case of a hot war, this is what the tanks would be looked like if they were deployed. Compared to the 2F, the lower frontal plate loses the Ramar, but gains a bolt-on Dorchester composite armour block, which does help, but enemies can still easily punch through the driver's port and gun breach. We also have a lot of antennas on this vehicle. In real life, this is an electronic warfare system, designed to block IED triggering devices. In War Thunder though, it's just more dead weight and the TES model clocks in at a whole 12.3 tons heavier than the base Challenger 2, basically nuking its mobility even more. Both the 2F and the TES generally make the strong parts of the tank stronger, but fails to deal with the major issues of the base tank, mainly the armor gaps in the turret breach and the driver's hatch. In my opinion, the 2F and the TES are by far the weakest challenges in the game and basically not even worth playing, or at least not equipping with the additional armor. Yes, the add-on armor is effective against chemical rounds, but I prefer the enhanced mobility over the armor. I have the add-on armor unticked in the modification settings, which does remove the weight, but also leaves you more vulnerable. Thankfully though, both of these tanks are now folded with the original Challenger 2, so they don't require over 400,000 research points each to unlock them. The next two challenges are more unique and actually worth grinding in my opinion. The first is the Black Knight. This is a technology demonstrator fitting a Challenger 2 with an active protection system. This consists of radar detectors and tube launch shaped charges. When the radar detects a missile heading towards the tank, the shaped charges are fired and detonate the missile before it hits the tank. This is largely a gimmick as obviously most tanks aren't firing missiles at you, but it can keep you safe from helicopters. Again though, it doesn't address the main issue with the Challenger series of tanks, that being the major frontal weak spots to AP FSDS rounds. The tank also gets bumped up to battery rating 11.7, solely for the addition of the APS, which is pretty dumb in my opinion as it doesn't protect you from the Sable rounds and the Black Knight lacks the additional armor protection. It's just a Challenger 2 base model with an add-on active protection system gimmick. And finally for our tech tree vehicles, we have the Challenger 2E. Like the Khalid from earlier, the 2E is a model aimed at export, fitted with a more powerful engine, going from 1217 horsepower to 1500 horsepower, using of course a German engine. With the enhanced engine power, it actually gives British top tier a decently fast main battle tank, 
but just like the other variants, you still have the major weak spots. I'm not going to moan though, a more mobile challenger is certainly workable, and you can have good success at top tier. I'd recommend taking plenty of backups on the Challenger 2e though lads, as if you get knocked out and have to go back to using some of these slower other Challenger 2s, it is very depressing. And that covers all the tech tree vehicles in rank 7. We only have one more premium and a squadron vehicle left to cover. The Challenger DS is the only rank 7 premium for the British and serves no real purpose, as we do not have a rank 8 yet in War Thunder. Any tank you can grind in the Challenger DS can also be grounded in the Rurikat or the Khalid. This tank is a straight copy and paste Challenger Mark II with a unique camouflage. It comes with all the strengths and weaknesses of the Tetri Challenger, it's strong at sniping and has an accurate gun. It doesn't get the upgraded L26 round though found on the Mark III and it still only has first generation thermal imaging. Compared to both the Khalid and the Rurikat, the DS has far worse mobility and overall poor tactical flexibility. Our bet is far more survivable than either of those premiums, and does fit nicely into the 10.3 British lineup. However, compared to the other rank 7 top tier premiums, such as the Leopard 2A4 Panzer Battalion, or the Soviet T-72 Terms, I feel like the Challenger DS is a lot less value for money. The M1 KVT, Panzer Battalion, and even the T-72 to some extent are fast and flexible, with high power guns and also have much more competitive lineups at their battle ratings, both in terms of backup vehicles and close air support options. I wouldn't recommend anyone buying the Challenger DS, instead putting a talisman on the Challenger Mark III or picking up one of the rank 6 premiums during a sale is a much better option. Our final vehicle, and one of the most controversial tanks added to War Thunder, is the Bishma. This is an engine produced variant of the T90 and would later be used as a basis by the Russians for the T90A. It differs from the base T90 by having a fully welded turret, and differs from the T90A found in the Russian tech tree by lacking IR dazzlers fitted to the front of the turret, being replaced by additional add-on armour blocks, which ironically means the best T90 in War Thunder is in the British tech tree, a rare British W. And arguably, the Bishma is the best British tank at battle rating 10.3. It gets second generation thermal imaging, 3BM42 Mango, and decent all-round protection. The mobility also makes the challengers look even worse, as the Bishma is generally quite nippy around the map, with the exception of the reverse gear of course. The Indians, just like the Russians, seemingly haven't grasped the concept of going backwards. It is slightly embarrassing for the British tech tree that the first spawn in the 10.3 lineup is both not British and an event vehicle. Compared to the TTD and the Challenger Mark III, it's hard to criticise the Bishma, Truly its only downside is the reverse speed, and is likely the main thing that's likely to get you killed. Another criticism is the fact that it is a squadron vehicle, meaning that you will have to grind it out over time by playing in a squadron, and you can buy it outright for golden eagles. But regardless, the Bishma is a very fun tank, and I use it as my primary spawn in my 10.3 lineup. Well lads, that's it, the entire British tech tree. As I said, a few recommendations, but mainly skips. A major criticism of the British is that we are rather bland and boring, and it's no different in War Thunder, especially for the first couple of ranks, only really getting some flair in rank 4 and 5, where we start to see gun stabilizers at lower battle ratings, and high caliber Hesh launchers like the FV4005. The upper ranks are also pretty stale, lacking any standout vehicles, both in terms of performance and pomp. We have no reliable beasts like the BVM or the Leopard 2A6, and we have no quirky vehicles like the Losa or the Object 279. We just have boring old Britain. Many of the British tanks are similar to the Challenger 2s, they have clearly defined negative aspects which force you into certain playstyles, which are usually very passive and not that fun to play. Most of the British lineups are usually a swing and a miss, but there are a few shining stars in the tech tree, like the Conqueror, Sherman Firefly, and Swingfire. But it's certain that the British tech tree is far less flexible than the American, German, and even the Soviet tech trees, making the British hard to learn, rigid to play, and lacking a lot of satisfaction you find with other nations. Before I leave you, I thought I'd quickly go over some of my lineup recommendations. The early battle ratings up to 2.7 are very strong for the British, the high penetration guns allow you to punch through pretty much everyone you come across, 
And it's same for the battle ratings of 3.3 and 4.7, with standout tanks such as the Sherman Firefly, Concept 4 and Avenger. But the traditional British clubbing BR of 7.3 is long dead now, and instead has been replaced by 8.3 and 8.7. The Chieftains at 8.7 are making a surprise comeback, as long as you play them a little cautiously. And many of the 8.3 tanks are severely underrated, while tanks such as the Warrior, Swing Fight and Striker are really seen in battles, in ideal situations, on the wider open maps, they are seriously strong in a competent player's hands. Another emerging power lineup is 10.3. The combination of the Challenger Mark III, Vickers Mark VII, and the Bishma makes for a very powerful but mobility limited lineup. The up tiers of this battle rating are also pretty rough, especially as you start encountering the gas turbine tanks, which outclass you in armor, firepower, and mobility. And finally, our last lineup is 11.7 or 12.0 with the Challenge 2s. While the Challenges are quite lacking, they can still be made to work very effectively. The Challenger 2 e is the standout tank here with its 1500 horsepower engine, which does at least give you a decent mobile tank at top tier. But as I've made clear, top tier pales in comparison to all of the other big three nations. And I'd even go as far to say that top tier Sweden is far more competitive than top tier Britain. But we all know the Swedish cheated and bought German kitty cats. Anyway boys, my voice is hurting and this script has now reached over 17,000 words. So I'm going to go and have a pint and watch Lord of the Rings. I hope this video helped you with your grand for the British tech tree. And hopefully you learned some facts about some of the British tanks. And if you didn't, at least you hopefully had an entertaining chuckle. And most importantly, if you made it to all the way to the end of this video lads, leave a comment saying King Charles.